Council. Um, let the record show that uh, I, tonight, I have Council Member uh, Tejeda, Council Member Momberger, and Mayor Pro Tem Davis are all on by Zoom. Uh, Council Member Barich uh, is excused um, from this meeting, so tonight I'm by myself in the Council Chamber. So at this time, we will have the invocation and Pledge of Allegiance as led by Mayor Pro Tem Davis. Would those in the Council Chamber please rise? Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. I want to start by acknowledging that there is so much going on in the world right now and during this pandemic as we see these powerful calls for racial justice. This is a moment where we are all mostly confined to our homes and hopefully better able to not look away from what truly matters. <coughs> The world lost prominent figures in the last week, including the Honorable Congressman John Lewis. His momentous legacy is marked by a lifetime commitment to his values of pushing for justice. A quote from his 2017 memoir reads, freedom is not a it is not some enchanted garden where we can finally Freedom is the continuous action we all must take, and each generation must do its part to create an even more fair, more just society. As we mourn this great loss and the loss of so many Americans in this present difficult moment, the late Maya Angelou's words provide a source of comfort and inspiration. She said, and when great souls die, after a period, peace blooms, slowly and always irregularly, Faces fill with a kind of soothing electric vibration, our senses restored, never to be the same, whispered to us, they existed, they existed. We can be, be, and be better for they existed. Thank you. And now please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag, to the flag. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Mr. McHugh, closed session report. Mayor and City Council, there was no reportable action this evening. Thank you, Councillor. At this time, we will take public comment. Uh, we have approximately 70, 75 uh, public comments that have come in uh, before five o'clock yesterday. Uh, you'll see the screen go up just to pictures of the members of the City Council while the City Clerk, City Manager, and City Attorney read those into the public record. Uh, we are anticipating that that will take 60 to 90 minutes uh, to do that. If you wish to stay on the line, uh, please feel free to do so. Uh, if not, please join us back here in about an hour and we'll see where we're at. And with that, Madam City Clerk, I'll turn the uh, floor to you. Thank you, Mayor. The first comments are general comments. First one received is Jonathan, Jonathan Scheidler. With recent financial strains in Redlands, I propose the city utilize AB 857, the Public Banking Act, to help finance civic projects as well as local from Redlands for Redlands employee-owned cooperative businesses that can keep funds close to our community. The Public Banking Act AB 857 allows a municipality to create, sponsor a public bank. This bank can provide public agencies access to loans at interest rates much lower than they could find at private banks, as well as provide equitable loans and services to local small employee-owned cooperatives. I emphasize employee-owned as the crux of any community bank is to fund the community and to ensure that funds do not provide capital for council members insert quotation marks corporate entity du jour here rather than rather remain funding our community in the hands of those performing labor locally a public bank can provide starting capital loans for local cooperatives at a reasonable rate not found at private banks ab 857 is all the more imperative with the recent illegal mass firing by an iconic local community employer in retaliation to unionization by employees seeking safer work environments. A market solution is to foster local employee-owned cooperative businesses. Employee cooperatives are, by definition, impossible to outsource, layoffs, or unjustly fire en masse 
due to labor disagreement. A public bank of Redlands funding agencies and small local cooperatives has an undeniable potential to make for a thriving, equitable, and solvent Redlands for years to come. Elizabeth Abenante, I would like to discuss if anything is being planned to assist Redlands small businesses during this extremely difficult time, especially Redlands small business owners that also live in Redlands. I called this morning to see if any discounts are being offered to find out that they are not, and I would appreciate for this to be added to the agenda. Ian Sandry, I must note that I have been happy to see the council members' Facebook updating about COVID and other Redlands issues. I am glad I'm in a city whose leadership has worked to inform citizens. Dennis Bell, at the last council meeting, a presentation was given regarding future budgeting predictions. It was stated there are no fee waivers in the current 2021 budget, but it didn't say anything about future budgets but it was all but confirmed in a news article that fee waivers would resume if the tax passes. The purpose of this tax increase isn't to be giving, isn't to continue giving the public's money away. If it is, then the words fee waivers should have been included in the ballot language. The above is a good reason to vote no. These dire predictions are chicken little, the sky is falling tactics to get people to vote for the tax. If the city wants to scare people, tell them their water and sewer bills will double starting next March to pay for the rebuild of the neglected sewage treatment plant. The city willful neglect of its infrastructure is another issue for November's election. And who is going to be appointed to the oversight committee if this tax passes? The usual go, go with the flow types that populate the city's commissions and boards. Is this committee going to have veto power over spending this tax? There's supposed to be audits of this tax money. There also needs to be a forensic audit of the city's books from the previous city manager's tenure. Maybe that's why the highly experienced and ethical previous finance director was run off by the city manager for questioning things while the council stuck its head in the sand. Uh, the next item is related to H6, Emergency Action Highland Avenue Water Pipeline Break. This is from Dennis Bell. Neither the staff report or news articles stated how old this broken pipe was. One of the council members recently remarked they don't see any mismanagement of the city. One can see mismanagement every time there's water seeping through the street pavement. The city is more interested in cultural amenities to satisfy the elites than maintaining and replacing its antiquated water lines. The city should give its water lines historic status. And 3.6 million gallons of lost water is no drop in the bucket. Is the monetary loss of that water covered, covered in the water department budget? The city needs to quit plotting to raise taxes to keep paying for luxuries over essentials. Uh, now we're gonna move to item J, no, sorry, uh, item I2. Is that right, Charlie? Am I doing, okay, sorry. I know I had to add his, okay, good. Okay, we, we are on to item I2, which is resolution number 8113, racism um, being declared as a public health crisis. Adam Martinez, as a Redlands resident, I would like to submit my support of resolution 8113 to affirm racism as a public health crisis in our city. I believe the local government must address this in order to make our beautiful city safe and equitable for all residents and visitors. Daniel Goman, I wanted to voice my support for item I2, the resolution to affirm that racism is a public health crisis. I am the project director and founder of the nonprofit group called The Artlands. We run a small gallery right across from City Hall on Vine Street. Some of the artists in our gallery have created posters and merchandise in support of Black Lives Matter movement, which we have displayed in our window as a sign of solidarity. Since doing this, we have heard numerous racist comments from passerbys. Additionally, we created a list of black owned businesses that can be supported in our Inland Empire communities. One of the messages that our businesses received through the form on our website is as follows. This is from the message left for them. It has come to my attention about the blackout day on July 7, 2020. This is where people are encouraged to buy from only, from only black owned businesses. I appreciate the list of black owned businesses you have listed. It lets me know where to never shop. I'm going to make sure that none of my money ever goes to black businesses. 
All this rioting, looting, and destruction has ruined it for me. And this back from the words of Daniel Goman. I moved to the city in 1998 as a high school student and have been in the area ever since. I was aware that racism was prevalent in this community, but the fact that these attitudes and views still exist in 2020 is in fact a public health crisis and should be affirmed as such. The next is from Gabby Hino Josa. In lieu of recent racial tragedies around our nation, it is utterly imperative that racism be deemed a public health issue. Extensive data depicts the racial disparities many black men and women face on a daily basis. According to a 2015 study, self-reported racism was positively associated with increased levels of negative mental health, examples of depression, anxiety, distress, psychological stress, negative effect, and post-traumatic stress. The study also highlights the significant negative relationships between racism and positive mental health, examples of self-esteem, life satisfaction. One, experiencing racism enacts a neurobiological and behavioral response that engenders stress pathways to work harder than one who does not experience racism. Two, these experiences are cons constant and unrelentless, and in today's racial climate, the fear is only escalating. One may argue that self-reported data may be biased, but statistical analysis of racial health disparities further upholds the argument. In one study, black people living in states with higher levels of structural racism were found to have a higher rate of heart attacks than those found in states with low levels of structural racism. Three, these problems are far too prevalent to be ignored. Us black people in Redlands face these issues on a daily basis. It is time that our community address these racial inequities. Be a community of change, not one that stays silent in the face of active discrimination. Uphold the City Council's core value of diversity by declaring racism a public health issue. Shanna Higgins. First, I'd like to thank Council Members Davis and Tejeda for drafting and presenting resolution number 8113, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Redlands affirming that racism is a public health crisis. I urge the City Council to affirm and adopt the resolution and proceed to develop plans for addressing this public health crisis. Such plans would specifically look at air quality, access to trees, greenery, parks, access to safe walkway sidewalks, adequate access to shared public resources, and opportunities to participate in decision uh, making on both the north side of Redlands, which is home to working class Redlanders, many of whom are black and Hispanic Latinx. The striking disparity in access to safe public spaces and resources on either side of the interstate is astonishing and should be addressed. Joe Richardson, Planning Commissioner. I wanted to express my support for the City of Redlands resolution affirming that racism is a public health crisis. As stated in the resolution passed by San Bernardino County, quote, racism is a public health crisis that results in disparities in family stability, health and mental wellness, education, employment, economic development, public safety, criminal justice, and housing, end quote. While recent times have created stressful, confusing, and tense moments, out of those moments, we have had to find opportunities. At this time, we as a city can declare that we recognize racism for the strain on our society that it is, and that no city, no matter how well-intentioned, is immune from its effects. All cities, including Redlands, have a responsibility to move our society forward through its own recognition and growth. That includes graduating from the satisfaction of being on good legal footing to the goal of being on good moral footing. Simply put, we have a moral responsibility to identify with the plight of those that are marginalized and who may have different, less secure realities within our area and even our city's borders because of the color of their skin. I respectfully submit that Redlands recognize recognition of racism as a public health crisis is a necessary first step in this process. May this be a moment when our city chooses to lead from recognition to difficult dialogue in safe spaces and to corresponding action for the betterment of our city and our surrounding community. Lenny Drillet of the Inland Empire Citizens Action Committee is a coalition of several groups located in the Inland Empire of Southern California. We have members located in 24 cities in San Bernardino County. We demand that the city exercise low local control and immediately terminate all involvement with the countywide vision by placing on the agenda for the next council meeting a resolution rescinding the countywide vision statement the council previously signed. 
County Board of Supervisors are out of control as they cave to political correctness. The nation is involved in unprecedented civil events. The board is cuddled, cuddled up to overt collectivist Marxism rhetoric in response to the George Floyd case. The board changed the countywide vi vision, adding an el equi equity element, thereby making the city culpable to racism rhetoric. Proclamation of public record, whereas the San Bernardino Board of Supervisors unilateral changed the countywide vision without consulting the city, and in doing so, changed the countywide vision to political statement directly associating the city with racism. Whereas we do not recognize the county's authority to arbitrarily make changes to affect citizens and residents' local control, whereas changes the county board made to the countywide vision nullified any trust between the city and the county, trust was supported in a resolution the city made for the countywide vision in 2011. Whereas we agree with the precedent setting action by the city of Hesperia in October 2018 to rescind countywide vision, we resolve that the city, officials, offi city officially and intend immediately terminate involvement with countywide vision by rescinding their endorsement resolution. Edward Ferrari. I'm writing in support of resolution number 8113, a resolution, a resolution of the city council of the city of Redlands affirming that racism is a public health crisis. I've reviewed the wording of the resolution thoroughly and I firmly believe that it aligns with both the factual evidence and current public opinion. It is my hope that the leadership of this city, like the leadership of the city of San Bernardino, will take the opportunity offered by this historic moment in American history and publicly acknowledge, as the resolution states, quote, the lives and experiences of black people, quote, end quote, do not matter, and that, quote, the lives and experiences of people of color living in Redlands matter. I am a white man and I am married to a woman of color and our black and our children look like America. The children were born in the city, will go to, a, to school in the city, will be represented by the leadership of the city, and will always have some tie to the city, no matter where they end up. We have a duty to ensure that our democracy at both the local and national levels works for them, for everyone. Again, it is my solemn hope that the leadership of the city will grasp that fact and support resolution number 8113. Sienna Beach. I am emailing you in regards to affirming racism as a public health crisis. As the city of San Bernardino has already done this, Redlands is slow to act, which is no surprise. The lack of urgency surrounding this issue is very telling of the people who live here. Writing this bill will not magically rid racism in Redlands. We all know how racist this region is and you cannot try and deny it. Own up to and address the racism here. Stop pretending it is only an issue in Yucaipa and Upland. Condemn the actions of bigots and make them uncomfortable. Performative activi activism is so tiring. Please do not just write this policy and think you've done enough for black, indigenous, people of color. And the author abbreviates this group of persons as BIPOC in the remainder of the comment. All eyes are on you, elected officials. Show us the true colors. Listen to the youth and the people who are trying to make our home a better place for all or be voted out. Take direct action and put money where your mouth is. Do not think posting the black square on Instagram or some MLK quote did anything to benefit Black Lives Matter. Support BIPOC businesses, provide free food and health services for BIPOC, create grants and funding for BIPOC creatives, entrepreneurs, academics, protect BIPOC, parens, meaning defund the police, close parens. There is no compromise here. There is no negotiating here. We are done with damage control and performative action. Racism is the pandemic. Capitalism is pandemic. Defund the Redlands Police. Solidarity forever. Next comment is Liliana Madrigal. As a young Latin American woman, I cannot speak firsthand on the pain that people of color face every single day due to racism in this country. I can only speak on my perspective in hopes of making their voices heard louder than ever before. I believe it is important to notice and bring to light the privilege I unconsciously am afforded every single day simply due to the color of my skin. Why is it that a person of color should face prejudicial treatment solely based on their skin color? Why is it that a white man slash woman is more likely to live in freedom versus a black man slash woman? Why is it that a black man slash woman should feel fearful to do what a person of privilege would consider simple day-to-day -day tasks? According to an article on the Washington Post, black Americans make up only 13% of the population, yet are killed at twice the rate of white Americans. Racism must be classified as a public health issue. The inequities must end it. In a short amount of time, I have become more and more aware of the racial injustice that occurs every single day throughout our nation, a nation that claims to have liberty and justice for all. 
In high school, they teach us to say Pledge of Allegiance every single day. We all have it memorized and understand the words that are said. Why are they not acted upon? This is not a problem that will be solved overnight. It will take time, awareness, and effort from the community as a whole. With enacting racism as a public health issue, we are taking the first steps to working together and fighting for injustice for our people of color. Next comment is from Jessica Duxay. I am writing in support of a city resolution to declare racism a public health crisis. Similarly to the coronavirus, the issues of systematic racism exist in our city, even though it may not affect you personally. It is clear that a portion of our community feels disadvantaged purely due to the color of their skin and other racial qualities and social economic status. It should be acknowledged this is true for not only our black community, but also others of Asian, Native, and Hispanic descent. It is clear there is a great need to direct city funding to the development of the north and west areas of Redlands. I look forward to supporting new city initiatives and projects this resolution will bring forth to lift up and support our underserved community. As a resident, a researcher in the field of public health, and with my experience in community coalitions, I offer my full support and expertise to the council as they develop these plans. Reach out at any time. Lastly, as a resident, I do not condone any city staff member or taxpayer person who knowingly supports racist behaviors, and that behavior will not be tolerated by this community. I urge the city to acknowledge racism as a public health crisis and hold one, accountab one another accountable. Wear a mask. Next comment is Juan Sanchez. Racism is a major health issue. We all deserve fairness. No one is better than the other. Next comment, Erin Durr. At the most recent board meeting for RUSD, so many brave current and former Redlands students shared very vulnerable stories of racism, lack of diversity, and lack of inclusion. I've also heard the same frustration from black business owners and other community members. We can do better than this, and the first step is recognizing there is a problem. We start with admitting that racism is a public health crisis, and from there we can create a better, stronger city where all will feel seen and safe. Next comment, Nancy Glenn. I am writing to encourage you to affirm resolution number 8113 that names racism as a public health crisis. As COVID-19 has proved, communities of color are highly affected by this virus, and this is due to systematic and institutional racism in our communities that at times we don't even recognize since it has been around so long, it just seems natural. Minority communities are dying at an alarming rate compared to white, more affluent communities. Racism is the cause. From COVID-19 to police brutality and violence, this needs to change. By being a forward-thinking council that will be viewed as standing on the right side of history, you can take this bold step to protect our relevance from racism. Thank you for the work you do. Next comment, Jan Andres. I'm a resident of Redlands. I am writing in support of Resolution 8113, which is a powerful gesture to show not only that you see your black and POC constituents, but also that you will not ignore their pain, frustration, and calls for change at this particular moment in history. Beyond gestures, I believe it's also an important way of pledging action by ensuring government and private sector attention to the persistent and systematic issue of racism in our community. I would like Redlands to be known as a, quote, city that works, unquote, for everyone, with systems and policies in place that will address and eliminate disparities and deep-rooted inequities. Please recognize this public health emergency and commit this city to doing better every day. This is from Jennifer. I have lived in Redlands for 25 years. I am a nurse, a homeowner, and a black woman. I have experienced racism extensively in this town. Sometimes it's blatant, like being followed around while shopping. Other times it manifests in locals who don't recognize their own bias, like being completely ignored while checking out at a grocery store so the cashier continue her discussion with a white patron. I have lost jobs, apartments, and opportunities in Redlands based on my skin color. At one point, I contemplated joining associates of the Redlands Bowl, only to be told I would be one of two black people out of 100, and I should just ignore the racist remarks from the older associates because they are stuck in their ways. This attitude is unacceptable. I have also been ignored while trying to order a drink at bars on State Street more times than I can count. I would like to see some accountability for business owners and social groups who actively discriminate Declaring racism a public crisis means there will be consequences for stores and people who treat myself and my family this way. Janice, Janice Inslee, I'm voicing my support for the resolution that affirms racism as a public health crisis in the city. And I also support any measures to defund the police and use those funds to support community services such as mental health and homeless support services. Redlands is a great city and I urge our leaders to fully embrace Black Lives Matter and make meaningful changes that lift up and create equality for the entire community. 
Ryan Fleet. I'm writing this letter as a white male from Highland, California, saying this racism, racism is in fact a public health crisis. Racism kills black Americans every day, yet this country has continually chosen to look the other way. I have witnessed the struggle of being black in America and in our own community, a community where many like to say, we don't have racists over here, or well, it's not as bad here as, when the truth is there is absolutely, absolutely no room for racism in our community. COVID-19 is a huge example of racism when you look how African Americans have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic. According to the CDC's four criteria, racism meets all the requirements to be considered a public health problem. It creates a large burden on society and is continually increasing. It impacts a certain population more than others, African Americans. There is evidence like police reform and education funding could be preventative strategies that could help racism but have not helped yet. This time should cause us all to reflect, no matter your skin color, and think about your actions past and present, and realize you are in a unique position to better our future and create change, which at the end of the day is our goal, to be able to say we were able to change the future for the better, and that starts with making racism a public health crisis. Samantha Madden, Madden, I am a third year student at the University of Redlands. During my years in Redlands, I have been very aware of the city's problems with racism and how racism is a major aspect of the city's reputation. For black people and other people of con color attending the university and living within Redlands, this creates an unhealthy living environment. I want to express my full support of Resolution 8113 and the declaration of racism as a public health crisis. Addressing that racism is a real crisis, is a vital step towards making important changes for the better. Hannah Otang Quarshi. As a resident of the city of Redlands, I ask for the consideration of racism being enacted as a public health crisis. The aspects of health that are debilitated and affected in various manners by racism call for it to be declared as a crisis. Racial profiling, discrimination, and racist comments make it difficult for those of us that are black and or people of color to feel welcome, safe, and accepted. Stress levels, actual heart issues, as well as weakened mental health caused by feelings of isolation and feeling devalued are just a few factors that play into the torments of being subjected to and experiencing racism. Please consider this for the well-being of all who live in the city. Plainly, I ask that the resolution of the City Council of the City of Redlands affirm that racism is a public health crisis. Thank you. Alexis Johnson, I moved here at the age of seven. I was the only black girl in my class until the fourth grade. That aspect in, and in itself had me feeling alone and alienated. Growing up, it was easy for me to make friends, but it never went unnoticed that nobody looked like me. I can't remember if that was the contributing factor as to why I always asked myself if the boy I had a crush on liked black girls. The feeling I felt that all black young girls feel should never be had. The backhanded compliments I grew up on such as you're pretty for a black girl or you don't have black people's hair play such a huge role in self-love and acceptance. What other race has to hear these things when they're a child? Do they have to be sat down by their parents and given the talk? I don't mean the birds and the bees, but the talk that explains I will be the target all my life in all matters due to my skin color, not if, but when. My kid ourselves to think, uh, oh, we kid ourselves to think we've come, how far we've come, but how can we come so far if the current opinion on black lives isn't the same as white lives? I say this because the black community is still pulled over more, imprisoned more, and killed more in police brutality. Black lives matter and they always will. They have always mattered and that's what needs to be taught in school. Hillary Temple, as a 20 year resident, Redlands resident, I have hope but also a lot of concern regarding the city of Redlands. Please consider declaring racism an emergency. If not, at the very least, continue to address racial bias in RUSD. Samantha Trad, it is essential to the health and well-being of our community that you pass resolution number 8113 declaring racism a public health crisis in Redlands. This resolution is very well written and I don't think there is anything that I can add to it. Other than as a citizen of Redlands, I encourage you strongly to pass this. Thank you for your time. Max Perry, please accept resolution number 8113 to recognize systemic racism as a public health crisis. 
I understand that the times are very divisive, but we need to strengthen the ideals of liberty for all by furthering the dismantling of centuries of racist action. We can do better and we must take should of the climate to keep moving forward. Thank you for hearing my two cents. Proud Redlander here that supports facing reality and having the hard conversations. Patrick Mason. Having read through resolution number 8113, I strongly, I strongly urge you to pass it. This city would benefit and prosper with such self-awareness and forward thinking. Without vision, a pupil perish, has been engraved in the Redlands Bowl for generations. This is the correct vision for the city to move forward as a city united. Please pass 8113 and be the standard for San Bernardino moving forward, not only words, but actions. Thank you very much. Janiah Glass. I have lived in Highland and attended school in Redlands for the past 10 years. The amount of racism that I've encountered and seen my peers encounter is disgusting. With the recent death of De George Floyd, racism has been highlighted in our community. People are starting to notice the discrimination that some of us face today. It's time for racism to be recognized as a public health crisis. I've heard so many disheartening stories from African Americans, Latinos, and Asians that have all grown up here. It's time to make a change for our future children who will grow up here. Jada Blocker. Racism should be deemed a public health crisis because of the effects it has on health care. Many black people in America are not treated properly by doctors. Doctors often believe that black patients are lying about their problems in order to be prescribed drugs. Black women are especially subject to this racism because they are ex expected to have a higher pain tolerance. I've personally experienced this as a young black woman since I was 13. I've made several appointments with different doctors over the past six years to express my health concerns. I only recently was diagnosed with the condition that has been ver that, that has very clearly been causing all of my problems over these years. My doctors have been known to give poor reasons for the symptoms of PCOS that I've had since I was 13. I'm now 19 and I have only recently diagnosed on an over the phone appointment with a doctor that I've never met. To me, this proves that getting proper care is much easier when race is not mentioned. I hope to see change in the near future to benefit future generations. Katie Alberts. As a citizen of Redlands for the past 27 years, I implore the city of Redlands to take a stand against the systemic racism that poisons this country. Be on the right side of history. Bring Redlands to the forefront of racial equality. Let's have a new reputation for being progressive and inclusive. Be the Redlands we can all be proud of. Leslie Gonzalez, I would like to voice my support for resolution number 8113 to affirm racism as a public health crisis in our city. I teach my students that change begins within. Likewise, I believe change begins at the local level. If we hope to, leave, if we hope to leave an equitable and just city for our children, if we truly want to be a city that works, we need to be a city that works for everyone. Kaylee Dickens. I'd like to contribute my voice on the racial disparities in Redlands. People of color are disproportionately affected by racism in all forms in Redlands. The nine points of addressing this issue in section four of resolution 8113 would be one, a wonderful starting point to addressing the racism in Redlands. Lauren Loeb, I'm writing to call on you to support resolution number 8113. The city of Redlands needs to acknowledge the systemic racism that occurs within our own city and institutions. Listen to your consti constituents and address so we can start to heal and continue advocacy for our minority communities. Jenna Valencia. I am a 20-year-old Mexican-American who grew up in the Inland Empire and has witnessed racism and wrongful racial profiling far too many times. Racism is an epidemic that has plagued so many innocent people, denying them of their peace and the right to be treated with equality. As I gained knowledge as an adult and began attending college, I realized and learned that institutional racism is a major problem and that it begins as early as our youngest years in schooling. Growing up in Highland and attending schools within the Redland School District, I never properly learned about any type of black history the way we learned about all the white heroes in history of non-colored people. In the schools I attended, as well as other schools in the district, there were only a handful of black or colored teachers. These systematic problems create, a very, create very long term negative effects on POC and black Americans. With racism being so doubly embedded into many aspects of society, 
the efforts are unfortunately inevitable and unhealthy to many families and individuals. Racism should no doubt be considered a public health issue because there are many factors that can contribute to the fact that it is. Racism has an effect on housing, education, mental health, mental heal, and physical health. These are all factors that should be determined solely due to the color, should not be determined solely due to the color of a person's skin. This comment is from Cameron J. Smith. We are not to sit back and deny the long history of oppression that certain people face throughout their lifetime, so much to the point that has become the norm. It is expected that marginalized individuals are to have higher tolerance and capability to cope with certain issues and illnesses for the simple fact that we have been forced to since the very beginning. Equality is more than warranted. Equal treatment, we will no longer tolerate such treatment. Uh, black people are disproportionately treated across all fields. I'm not here to give the numbers, just the facts, and it's no secret. This has caused a system built on oppression to further oppress, and racism is so institutionalized that supporters and oppressors alike do not realize its presence. I call on you to make change. Help the individuals in your community first. Take action before others. Lead by example. Do not lead by example. Racism takes a toll on the lives and efforts of people on a minute scale at some times, and in other instances, the matter is much more grave. But in all the collection of trauma and self-defense and mannerisms that must be adopted throughout one's lifetime, truly take a toll on physical and psychological health. Can we deal with it? Yes, we can, because we are forced to. But why should this continue? Equal opportunity, equal rights. It is simple to carry on as usual only because this is the way we have all lived our days. By the time to, but the time to speak up is now, and I, along with many others, will make it known that. This next comment is from Matteo Blocker. Racism should be deemed a public health crisis. It needs to be a public health issue because it is something that can affect a person's mental health heavily. A person being talked to differently or looked down upon because of their skin color is something that can affect how they not only see themselves, but how they feel about who they are and who their family is. Personally, I believe this starts in young ages because I went through that as a kid. I remember being in kindergarten and finally being around other kids for the first time in my life, and none of them looked like me or like my dad. My mother is white and my father is black. My skin complexion is not that dark, so most kids didn't even realize I was black. But I remember when my dad would pick me up from school, the other kids, my friends, quote, would say things like, quote, you're black, with a certain tone, or, quote, why is your dad that color? And me being five years old, I didn't know how to deal with that, and I was embarrassed. My point that I am trying to make is that is what kids today go through. They deal with problems they are not equipped to deal with. That personal experience made me hate being black when I was little, because all I wanted to do was fit in with the other kids and not get made fun of. I wanted to be just like everybody else. The next comment is Kathy Dean Sandanella. My child was in the first grade at Redlands Unified School District when another child told her she was, open quote, too dark, close quote, to be her friend. She was in the fourth grade when she came to me crying that she wasn't skinny like the other kids in class. And that is the year we battled, parens, and won, thank God, close friends, the war on eating disorder. Racism is absolutely a health crisis and it is killing our kids. There is no name to this next comment. Being an African American in society is already a difficult task. Having to deal with blatant racism, healthcare inequality, or even just the amount of dissatisfying looks I receive walking into a retail store. This systematic racism is also very much alive in my community, which is disappointing to say the least. I've had to deal with people trying to attack me just because the melanin in my skin is slightly pigmented in comparison to them. Racism is a public health issue that needs to be addressed and brought to an end. The next comment is Bryce Lawson. As a young black man growing up in the few cities, mainly San Bernardino, I have experienced racism as a child up to an adult. Racism is, has affected me growing up because it changed my mindset as a young child and how I think today. Encountering racism as an adolescent has taught me to be more aware of who I am and made me skeptical about how people think of me because of my skin color. Racism affects society and the way of thinking of many young black people. Children should not have to live in fear and grow up before other children due to the color of their skin. Not only does it affect children, it also affects older individuals on how they maneuver through life with fear they can be taken at any given moment and living life knowing they are a target. Because it causes us black men and women to live with an unsettling chip on our shoulder. Unfortunately, under these certain circumstances, this is what builds our character and allows us to be aware and level-headed knowing what we are up against in this society. It is not fair that we not have an equal chance in life and that we have to work 10 times harder to be successful, but it is a reality we live every day. The next comment is Sierra 
Felt-Morales. I am 20 years old and I have been raised in Redlands since I was able to attend school. As a Mexican-American student at the University of Redlands, I'm now reflecting on how Redlands could have and should do better in addressing the topic of racism. For this reason, I'm taking the stance that the resolution affirming racism as a public health crisis must be passed. As many people within the community have seen, there are growing tensions within this city. However, I believe that these tensions can be eased if the community knows what stance the local government is taking. With this in mind, I believe that now more than ever, it is a perfect time and opportunity for the local Redlands government to step up, take responsibility, and act as a catalyst in the Inland Empire area to declare racism as a public health crisis. By declaring racism as a public health crisis, Redlands will be taking a step in the right direction by acknowledging and providing safety to all black, indigenous, and persons of color. The city of Redlands must recognize and evaluate the standard of protecting and valuing all community members. With this intention, the local government should have no other thought and option than declare racism as a public health crisis. Lake Westerberg, by definition, by definition, racism is prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism directed against a person or people on the basis of their membership of a particular racial or ethnic group, typically one that is a minority or marginalized. Black, indigenous, and or people of color, BIPOC, have been disadvantaged in nearly every aspect in American history, and the healthcare system is one. It is my understanding that the county of San Bernardino has declared racism as a public health crisis, but individual cities have freedom to act on their own. My letter today is to urge the city of Redlands to declare racism as a public health crisis and to actively find ways to combat this disadvantage for BIPOC within healthcare facilities. The AAMC released an article discussing the myths within the healthcare system regarding BIPOC, and they state, half of white medical trainees believe such myths as black people have thicker skin or less sensitive nerve endings than white people. American Heart Association news state that black women are three to four times more likely to die from pregnancy-related causes than white women. These are just a few of the many myths that students are told while they are in nursing school or other health-related education systems. This demand for change runs deeper than just police reform or general education for racist individuals. This can be daunting, but that should not hinder the change that needs to happen. How can one enact change? Do nothing is perpetuating the vicious cycle of racism. Meg Hartel, racism is a public health crisis. Please adopt resolution number 8113, a resolution of the city of Redlands affirming that racism is a public health crisis. I am not from Redlands, but I want to make it my home and raise my children here. Please, please make this a safe city and an anti-racist place for them to grow up in. Julia Lenhart, I am an Esri employee, voter, and active member of the Redlands community. I am writing to strongly support Resolution 8113, affirming that racism is a public health crisis. Racism is a driving force of the social debt de determinants of health, like housing, education, and employment, and is a barrier to health equity. I want my community to actively and intentionally join the effort to dismantle systemic racism so that all of us will benefit from a more equitable, just, and diverse community. Natalia Ponce, racial inequality is and has been a public crisis for centuries, but it has now been declared that it is a crisis in the county of San Bernardino. Racism happens everywhere, and to know it happens within our own community is something I will not abide by. Growing up, I never really knew how much inequality there was and still is in our system until I began going to college and taking courses on different cultures, race, and racism. It opens my eyes to know how much lack of leadership we have during these times of injustice. Personally, seeing friends and family being affected by the acts of racism is something I will not just watch and overlook. My voice matters and I want to see a change in the system in our community. Change starts with us and we all want peace and equality, but in order to have that, we must have justice in all parts of inequality. In the recent tragedies of the BLM movement, it comes to show that many of us are tired of the oppression in our communities and are demanding the rights and justice we deserve. I write this to validate that racism is a public health crisis in my hometown, City of Redlands. Hannah McInespy, please adopt the resolution to declare racism a public health crisis. 
Redlands is the definition of white privilege. Our, t our library, town and gown conservancy, the bowl, youth groups and more have remained silent during this season of unrest. Silence is unwelcoming. A declaration is a starting point for awareness, talk and action. This comment is uh, from uh, someone who didn't provide their name. Yes, racism is a public health crisis. Since this country's inception, white supremacy has infiltrated almost every system, public and private. The devastating effects are still seen today. As long as there is racial equity, discrepancies in housing, employment, education, health, criminal justice, etc., there is work to be done. The general population has not been educated about the long history of oppression in our country and may not recognize their own biases and harmful behaviors towards BIPOC. As a former teacher in Redlands and surrounding areas, I was responsible for making all students feel safe. I learned a lot on my own, but I should have been directly trained in implicit bias, and I should have been made to examine my own classroom data. This is true for all people, especially those in authoritative positions. These conversations should be happening at all levels. Melissa Albers, I fully support Resolution 8113 and look forward to its implementation. I would like to see full transparency from all public sectors using data to drive and justify their actions. Section 4E is especially critical to indicate if progress is indeed made in Redlands. Thank you for your attention to this very urgent and important matter. Rebecca Richman, I am writing in support of declaring racism a public health crisis. Black Americans suffer from COVID, are less likely to be given painkillers, and are more likely to die during childbirth because of racism. We need to take sure that all Americans have access to equitable health care. Stephanie Peake, as a longtime resident of Redlands, I urge our city to declare racism a public health crisis. Let's follow the example set by the County of San Bernardino. Doing so would, would be a step in the right direction for our residents of every creed. Matthew Co Kober. I'm a Redlands resident and I am in favor of Resolution 8113. I feel racism is a public health crisis. This is something I have encountered in my former place of employment and I, the streets of Redlands. Anything that, I, that can be done that will help the community through its leaders and public servants to temper this crisis would be a vast improvement over the inaction that is seemingly taken with regard to this issue on a broader stage. Mary Grace Maloney. I'm writing an enthusiastic support of resolution number 8113. For the city of Redlands to affirm racism is a public health crisis. Firstly, I'm incredibly impressed that members of the council initiated this resolution. Having lived in Redlands for three years as an undergraduate student, and most recently six years as a permanent resident in the city, I've witnessed a tremendous change in the city that is more reflective of the values I share with my husband, friends, neighbors, and colleagues. This resolution further moves the city forward on a pro positive path, more inclusive of all people of all races, cultures, identities, genders, and ages. For example, last year, the city acknowledged Pride Month for the first time in its history. While this acknowledgement was embarrassingly late in terms of the gay liberation movement of the 1970s, it was a significant step in the right direction for the city. To be a proactive leader in this region of the country and keep this momentum going, I urge city council members to vote to pass resolution number 8113. This resolution provides a strategic plan with attainable action steps, such as mandatory trainings on implicit bias, diversity, equity, and inclusion for city staff, elected officials, board members, etc. As a professional in higher education, I can attest to the importance of these trainings, not just for improving the lives of the people you serve through your leadership, but as forms of necessary professional development in the workforce of today and tomorrow. Courtney Mara. I'm a Redlands native. I went to Cope Middle School, Redlands High School, and the University of Redlands. I love our town and would love even more to get to truly experience some improvements to this town during my lifetime. I wholeheartedly support resolution number 8113 to recognize racism as a public health crisis. This will be a great start. I look forward to continuing to fight the good fight with the support of the city. Marianne Wells. I'm writing to support the city council resolution in support of City Council Resolution 8113, affirming racism as a public health crisis. Thank you to the groups and city leadership that put this resolution together to aid in providing local support in combating this national problem. Ian Vera Sandri. 
I urge the City Council to affirm and adopt the resolution number 8113 and proceed to develop plans for addressing this public health crisis. Such plans would specifically look at air quality, access to trees slash greenery, parks, access to safe walkways, sidewalks, adequate access to shared public resources, and opportunities to participate in decision making on the north side of Redlands, which is home to working class Redlanders, many of whom are black, African American, and Hispanic Latinx. The striking disparity in access to safe public spaces and resources on either side of the interstate is astonishing and should be addressed. I'm most interested in walkways and sidewalks as when I drive through the north side, I see less sidewalks or movable sidewalks, spaces that those who use wheelchairs, hindering people's ability to safely move throughout the space. Tracy Wise. My thanks to Mayor Pro Tem Denise Davis and Council Member Eddie Tejeda for introducing Resolution 8113, affirming that racism is a public health crisis. Racism has been woven into the fabric of our nation since its beginning, and it has therefore become structural. To those of us who are white, we have the luxury of pretending that it does not exist, because that is where we are placed in the structure. Nevertheless, we know that it, that it exists. This does not mean that poverty or illness do, do not affect the members of our community who are white. It means that issues like these disproportionately affect black and Latino and other members of color of this community. We are seeing this currently in the high numbers of those sickened and dying from COVID-19. Recognizing that racism, racism is a public health crisis is the first step toward addressing it. I urge our city to come together as a community and work together in, doing, in doing so. We will be stronger and healthier as a result. I wholeheartedly support Resolution 8113 and urge the city, Redland City Council to pass it. Carrie Marie Morgan, I'm a mom of a black daughter and my heart breaks almost every day over the racial injustice that we see. I've seen how racism plays out within her and her behaviors. My daughter no longer wants to go for runs in our community. She loses sleep, she cries, a lot. She carries the burden of racism that has been pushed on her by our society. As it deeply affects her, racism can be defined as organized systems within societies that cause avoidable and unfair inequalities in power resources, capacities, and opportunities across racial or ethnic groups. A study done by the National Center of Biotechnology Information concluded that racism is associated with poor mental health, including anxiety, depression, psychological stress, and various other outcomes. In the same study, they state that racism can impact health via several, so several different pathways. One, reduce access to employment, housing, and education. Two, reverse cognitive emotional processes and associated psychopathology. Three, allostatic load, the wear and tear in the body, and concomitant pathophysiological processes. Four, diminished participation in healthy activities such as sleep and exercise. Five, physical in in injury as a result of racially motivated violence. I'm calling on the city council to yes, declare racism a public health crisis, and then move forward with in intentional action with programs and systems to pull our community up. This comment is from Michael Smith. My thanks to Mayor Pro Tempore Denise Davis and Council Member Eddie Tejeda for introducing Resolution 8113, affirming that racism is a public health crisis and outlining steps that will be taken to address it. I only support this resolution, the statement it makes about who we want to be as a community and what it means for our ability to move forward in meaningful ways as a community. Gabriel. I'm writing in support of resolution number 8113, affirming that racism is a public health crisis. By passing this resolution, the city of Redlands will show that it is on the right side of history. Janelle Guerrero. I'm a newly appointed member of the Human Relations Commission. Healing as a community requires acknowledgement of the problem, friends, racism, close friends, and identifying crisis as it happens, and then positioning the proper resources to allow for full recovery. Racism persists in all capacities because of the failure to acknowledge oppression and the disparities and division it creates. We are witnessing the tipping point where our community is crying out in pain and its voice must not only be heard, but supported with guidance and direction from our leadership. This is not a time to pretend it doesn't exist. This is not a time to ignore the cries. We are under moral obligation to speak for and protect our people in this community. Most importantly, those who continue to be oppressed. I strongly support identifying racism, the public health crisis in Redlands. I would love the opportunity to speak to it personally if needed to pass this resolution. Kelly Famigetti. 
I wholeheartedly support Resolution 8113 and urge the Redland City Council to pass it. Julia Brown, the same exact comment. I wholly support Resolution 8113 and urge the Redland City Council to pass it. Jackie Osanga. Redlands is located within the Inland Empire, which is historically categorized as having a majority of low-income to middle-class areas. The existence of low-income hubs are no accident. Redlining in the 1940s and 50s was direct government action to segregate people of color into condensed areas. The bottom line is that Redlands has an undeniably large community of color which is witnessing the effects of pre-established racist standards. It is known that low-income areas often project unnecessary traumas on young people due to the lack of resources, safety, and even access to clean air. Although the Redlands Unified School District is one of the top performing districts in the Inland Empire, RUSD severely lacks in funding when comparing to higher income areas such as nearby Orange County. I witnessed through personal experience of leaving the IE for college on how the lack of funding RUSD hinders my educational career. Furthermore, hubs of Redlands are home to low income slash minority groups that lack access to safe community centers and healthy food options, as well as less funding for the area in general. The Redlands slash San Bernardino area is home to multiple large warehouses and shipping companies, which is a leading factor as to why the Inland Empire has such poor air quality. It is also widely researched that poor air quality leads to developmental problems within children, such as asthma and even premature births, putting Redlands and its ma major community of POC at risk. The multitude of issues people of color face in our county is long established and systematic issue that can begin to be addressed by internal action within the city. Given the extent of trauma people of color must face educationally, mentally, physically, and institutionally, racism should be declared as a public health issue. Next comment is D.C. Lozano. Racism is a public health crisis. Racism is a public health crisis. Racism is a public health crisis. If we say it three times, will it make systematic racism disappear? No. But by affirming race resolution number 8113, we can clearly and finally acknowledge the work we need to do at every level in our society to begin eradicating the effects of a nation built on slavery. Systematic racism is harming and killing black, Latinx, and other people of color in our communities, whether through unfair police practices or violence or through purposeful disadvantages, social econo socioeconomic conditions that contribute to serious health issues. This is a fact. Those who deny these facts do so at the embarrassment of their descendants and the poor repute of their legacies. I will gladly accept the resig resignations of any no voter on the council this evening who doesn't stand proudly behind 8113. I have full faith, however, that the members of this council will be concordant in their yes to this resolution. With your unanimous decision, you will open up space that will allow our community to do the hard work we need to do as we push towards clear policies and procedures that can rinse clean the ugly stain that has been underpinned on the red, white, and blue for far too long. Let us lead toward a better America that has been grand, yes, and brave often, but great, not yet. Next comment, Kendall Green. I'm a 21-year-old black male in the community. I write this letter today saying that black people in America are in a state of emergency. We have been the victims of oppression, ostracization, and the overall system that has deemed black life as less than meaningful. The system, systemic racism that has plagued this country is starting to have a light shown upon it like never before. For over 400 years, black people have been fighting to obtain equal ground in this country. The words in the Declaration of Independence, quote, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, close quote, have not been applied to black people. Where is the life when in some parts of the country, black people are six, time, six times more likely to be killed by police than white people? Where is the liberty when in ci certain cities like Los Angeles, up to 90% of the black male population has either been in prison, jail, or on parole? Where is the pursuit of happiness when waking up black in America will undoubtedly put a target on your back like no other thing in America will? Millions of black people have died for the simple reason of racism. I hope that the city of Redlands can take the first step to try to fix this injustice. Next comment, Ellis Stevens. Racism has affected me in a number of ways throughout my childhood and still does today. I attended third through 12th grade in RUSD. I recall other students using racial slurs towards me two times. In elementary school, I was playing on the playground at Highland Grove and was called the N-word and didn't even know what it meant. Other students near me heard what was said and told me what it meant. Then I broke down in tears. The second incident was in BT band when I was in seventh grade. I was again called the N-word several times that day by the same student. 
I told Mr. Allen, the band director, who said he will handle it. That student was suspended and I don't remember seeing him again. Those types of incidences are degrading and made me feel less valuable as a human when we are all supposed to be equal. We're gonna to move to a new topic now. This is item J2, Delinquent Administrative Citation Fine Report. First comment is Edward Awad. Code Enforcement Officer Gonzalez came to my home, unauthorized, she went inside, took pictures, and went inside my wife's bedroom. Nobody authorized her to enter my home. I called the state police because she said it was the state who authorized her to enter the house. She's dishonest. 10 years ago, the city made me tear down a shed that existed on the property before I purchased the home. There is proof with satellite pictures it existed before. The city made me pay $15,000 in penalties. The city is unlawful and un unethical because there is a city law. You can construct or erect a, a structure like Hangar 24. Therefore, you cannot give me a citation. I want all my money back plus punitive damages. It comes to 1.8 million. I want the city to write me a check. Please stop harassment, stop following my kids, stop following me. Officer Aguilar gave me a ticket and his immunity is gone. I will see him in court. I did make a report on him in 2019 with Internal Affairs Officer Martinez. The police chief never called me to provide a resolution. He's too busy harassing my family. Officer Shahabi is on camera with five witnesses. He told me the house didn't belong to me anymore. He said he was going to enter and rearrange my home. He and his colleague did go inside and destroyed my home. Officer Knoll told me the state did not destroy my home, but it was the Redlands police officers who destroyed my property. This is from Amber Fozzi. This letter is to formally appeal the charges on my property and work towards a resolution that is fair and empathetic. I have owned the property for almost 30 years. I have never been in default or accrued such penalties in the past. The reasons that I am requesting you not place a special assessment tax on my property include, I do not live at the property. I do not receive any notices until the letter dated 7-8-2020. Had I received any notices starting from January 2020, I would have taken action to resolve the citations. As soon as I received the letter addressed to my current location in Artesia, I reached out to the city in an effort to resolve the citations. While it is no fault of the cities that I did not receive the notices, had I received them without a doubt, I would have responded earlier and the charges would not have escalated to the amount they are today. My wife and I are senior citizens and given the circumstances of COVID have been sheltering in place since early March, 2020. These unprecedented times have further impaired my ability to visit my property or check my mail over there. As such, I did not uh, receive any of the notices as stated. My wife and I are retired and do not have the financial ability to pay the amount assessed. I am willing to work with you and arrive at a just solution. Next one is Dana Matthew on behalf of the Lee Family Trust. I am requesting you pull 107, 108, 126, and 208 West Colton Avenue matters off the agenda. We have given a timeline to complete the items for each property to John Marquez, CCEO, and have been working with him to complete them. 95% of the items have been completed. I also spoke with Tabitha Kavari, senior manager concerning the citations. We do understand the importance of keeping the properties maintained and up to city standards. The homes are low income housing and the monthly rent is well below standard. The rent for the above properties, single family homes, range from 800 per month to 1,000. My father, Andrew B. Lee, has owned these homes for many years and has worked with the tenants on the rent to keep a roof over their head so they would not be homeless. He worked closely with the family service to find people that do not have a place to stay or a place to rent. I would appreciate it if, if you would grant my request to pull the properties from the list so we can work with code enforcement staff. The next one is from Denise Whistler. Please know that the City of Redlands received back from the San Bernardino County Tax Office some $62,000 for all citations for fiscal year 2016 through 2017 and through fiscal year 2018 through 2019 for the 1225 Brookside Avenue property. Please know that the City of Redlands received back from San Bernardino County Tax Office some $43,000 around May 2019 for the City of Redlands Special Assessment for fiscal year 2018-19, including what your department has already charged 
find received payment for these six citations in 2018. Apparently the city of Redlands, including the facilities and community services department needs more money for salaries, bonuses, whatever. I was saddened to hear that some of our outstanding city staff left a couple of weeks ago due to city Redlands city manager and those deciding who got to stay and who were pushed out the door. I have repeatedly stated that the fine citations for 1225 Brookside Avenue are not valid and that the fine citations are perceived as retaliatory, unfairly punitive and malicious with deliberate intent to harm me. Please also see um, letters to the facility and community services department dated July 15th of this year and July 16th. The $62,000 already received by the city of Redlands includes the $15,000. Please do not approve the charging of delinquent balance as of this notice, $15,000 or any amount. And the next comment is from Ken Patchett. In speaking with the code officer, I was informed this hearing today was only to decide if the $6,000 debt would be sent on to the county assessor, auditor, controller, added to the tax to my house taxes. I do not want any more taxes applied to the tax debt on my sole piece of property and residence on College Avenue. The current tax debt from previous fines has caused great havoc enough as its existence threatens my own. With every month that passes, it becomes increasingly difficult to imagine ever being able to ever have a chance of paying. Unfortunately, with the previous time I received a like notice informing me that a public hearing was taking place for some reason, I had received it two days after the hearing took place. So obviously was denied any input into the resulting action of attaching a debt that I, had, that I was not able to pay. If there is any way to reverse this previous decision by the council, please let me know. Also this time I did receive the current notice in a timely manner. It was very unclear as to what I was supposed to do besides respond with some form of objection without any of the essential details where or how the notice would or should be sent. In addition, there were no instructions considering COVID limitations or that this meeting would not even be open to the public at all, but would be closed as this has added to the already potentially debilitating, debilitating stress or confusion over this issue. This has been similar to my experience dealing with city codes as they all seem very open to much interpretation and are virtually impossible to pin down to avoid confusion. And the last comments we have are related to item K6, development agreement, tentative track map 16878. This is from Doug Juritzma. I have had the pleasure of being a Redlands resident and involved in the residential land business for over 30 years in the area, completing several dozen transactions in the city, totaling approximately 1,000 lots. Redlands is a higher, highly desirable location for development. As a result, the supply is very constrained with regards to new residential opportunities. I have specifically been involved with the loan Chang property since 2005. Unfortunately, due to the recession, we were unable to transact with a merchant home builder. Since that time, the entitlement complications have prevented a builder from acquiring the property. The uncertainty of the map, coupled with the lack of final engineering, have prevented serious buyer interest. Additionally, the remaining entitlement expenses and the escalation of, an, of construction costs have posed serious challenges to the ownership's ability to, structural, to structure a reasonable deal. The project represents a wonderful opportunity to provide upscale housing in the neighborhood. The recent successes of the KB Home, Lenar uh, Diversified Pacific, Master Craft, and Beezer Homes projects clearly have demonstrated the need for additional residential development. The infrastructure improvements for, and fee revenue would also provide significant benefit to the city especially in these unsettling COVID-19 times. Presently, in spite of the virus, the new home market is very robust with home builders achieving record sales activity. If a development agreement were approved and entitlement secured, I can guarantee the project would attract significant merchant builder interest. The site would be developed immediately upon completion of the final engineering. I am urging you to grant approval of the contemplated development agreement for July 21st. Thank you, Madam City Clerk, Mr. City Manager, and Mr. City Attorney for uh, reading all those into the records. We appreciate the comments of all of our residents. 
um, on all of the topics that uh, we have before us uh, this evening. Uh, at this time, we will move on to the consent calendar. Uh, items H6 and H16 are being removed from the agenda at the request of staff. So there'll be no action taken on those items uh, at this time. Uh, however, uh, Council Member Tejeda has requested to make comment on both item six uh, and item H16. I'm sorry, item H16 is not being pulled. Forgive me, Council Member. But you wanted to make comments on H6 and H16. Uh, we will start with H6. Council Member Tejeda. I'm here, sorry, I was pressing the wrong button to unmute. That's okay. <laughs> um, actually, I don't have a comment for H6. I wanted to pull that just so that it was uh, available for the public to see. It's being pulled completely from the agenda. Would you like to go ahead and make comment on H16 as you requested? Absolutely, all I wanted was to have that. Uh, I would like to give the city manager an opportunity to update the public. Mr. Duggan. The make sure I don't remember exactly when it happened, uh, but uh, staff came to work and found that a 16 inch water main was uh, breached and upwards of five million gallons a day could be released uh, from the break in that water main. Uh, they sprang into action. Uh, we were able to put a bid together quickly. Uh, the reason that it was bid out was because we do not have the specialized equipment to quickly fix a 16 inch water main break. It's also was uh, somewhere between 16 to 20 feet deep, I believe, which uh, requires special trenching and shoring up equipment. Uh, again, all of that would be too expensive for us to maintain as infrequent as we have these. So we did put together a bid. We had four bidders. Uh, we took the lowest bid and within uh, about 48 hours had everything back in place the state did require us to test twice, um, and both tests came back clean. Uh, whenever you uh, put in a water main, uh, you do uh, the cleaning and testing. Uh, everything by Friday morning was back up and running uh, after some late nights uh, by quite a few people. So uh, our MUAD staff uh, wor uh, worked around the clock to make sure that uh, the citizens of Redlands uh, did not go without water. Uh, if water the water pressure dipped below a certain level, we would have to issue a, a boil water. Uh, we are happy to say that that never happened. Uh, we were able to maintain water pressure by uh, bringing in water from other parts of the system and opening up uh, different areas. So altogether, uh, it could have been uh, a very difficult time uh, for the citizens, uh, but instead our staff was able to um, step up and, and get it taken care of. Thank you, Mr. Duggan. I uh, appreciate that uh, report. Uh, Councilmember Tata, was that what you wanted? Absolutely. Great. And along with, uh, on behalf of the City Council, Mr. Duggan, I'd like to thank you and all the members of the City team that uh, jumped into action so quickly. I know you and I were communicating very early on in that process. I had a lot of questions, as did I'm sure the other members of the Council. You guys answered them very promptly. Um, I particularly want to draw uh, special thanks to Public Information Officer Baker, who was very quickly getting word out on all platforms so that people were aware of what's going on. Very grateful to our good fortune that we didn't lose water completely to all the homes, um, but certainly admire the city team, and I know the council is, is most appreciative of that. With that, I would entertain a motion to approve the balance of the consent calendar. Do we, didn't, we, did, do we uh, receive and file this first? No, we take an action on the entire calendar. Okay, uh, so moved. Second. It's been moved by Councilmember Tejeda, seconded by Mayor Pro Tim Davis. All those in favor, I'm sorry. Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Tejeda. Yes. Councilmember Momberger. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Davis. Yes. Mayor Foster. Yes. Motion is approved unanimously. I'd like to remind the public, just uh, so that they are aware if they weren't here at the beginning of the meeting, uh, Councilmember Barrich uh, is not with us this evening. He had a family emergency, so he is unable to attend uh, tonight's meeting. Moving on, uh, the next item is the discussion and possible action relating to the cancellation of August 4th, 2020 and August 18th, 2020, 
regular uh, meetings of the City Council. It's an item I placed on the agenda. It's traditional that we are dark uh, during August. Uh, unless the Council has any objection, uh, I would move approval of uh, this item. Second. Hi. Sorry, this is Tony. It's all right. Uh, it's been moved, seconded by Council Member Momberger. Madam City Clerk, would you please call the roll? Council Member Tejeda. Yes. Council Member Momberger. <laughs> yes. Mayor Pro Tem Davis. Yes. Mayor Foster. Yes, the motion passes unanimously. Uh, the next item uh, of business is the discussion and possible action relating to resolution number 8113, affirming that racism is a public health crisis. Uh, this is an item on the agenda by Mayor, placed on it by Mayor Pro Tem uh, Davis and Councilmember Tejeda. Uh, I assume the two of you have decided who would like to speak uh, or in what order you'd like to speak on this item. Uh, yes, thank you. I will go first and then I'll turn it over to Councilmember Tejeda. First of all, I want to say that I'm tremendously proud to co-present this resolution tonight and want to extend my sincere gratitude to Councilmember Eddie Tejeda, who has worked diligently as a co-creator of this important document. It's been a long process, really over the last month and a half. We talked with many different community groups and individuals and went through countless drafts to make sure every word was reflective of the feedback we had received and, and our intentions for clearly affirming that racism has caused tremendous harm across the country and in our city of Redlands. We recognize that racism won't be eradicated, unfortunately, with the passage of this document, but see this as an important step forward in building a more inclusive, welcoming, and anti-racist community. While I encourage everyone to read this document in its entirety, for the sake of time, I've chosen just a few passages to highlight tonight. Resolution number 8113, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Redlands affirming that racism is a public health crisis. Whereas racism results in a structured absence of opportunity and the assigning of a person's societal value based <coughs> solely on physical characteristics such as skin color, which creates unfair disadvantages for some individuals and communities while simultaneously creating unfair advantages for other individuals and communities, therefore, preventing societies as a whole from achieving their full potential. And whereas the United States Office of Disease Prevention recognizes that racial discrimination negatively impacts health outcomes and further, the US Census Bureau has documented a significant increase in anxiety and depression among black people nationally following the May 25th, 2020 killing of Mr. George Floyd in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And whereas in response to this and the death of countless others previously and subsequently under similar and other such circumstances, people across the country have risen to protest against historic acts of systemic racism and the resulting historic economic, environmental and social injustices occurring towards people of various races and ethnicities, which continues to disproportionately affect the black community. And whereas this city council acknowledges the historic grievances held by black Americans and the various forms of injustice that people of color have experienced for generations and further recognizes the opportunity for our city to participate in the healing process with members of our black and Latino communities and other communities of color by acknowledging past transgressions. And now therefore be it resolved that this city council declares that racism is a public health crisis and further acknowledges evidence of such throughout the historic development of our city. Also, this city council declares that the lives and experiences of black people matter and furthermore, that the lives and experiences of people of color living in Redlands matter. Also, this city council endorses the continued implementation and use of policies and practices for employee conduct and equitable treatment of all people and honors by approval of this resolution, the common humanity of all people regardless of race or ethnicity Moving on to section four, this city council commits to actively participating in the dismantling of the remnants of racism by, and there's a number of, out, uh, of, of bullet points outlined in this section. Um, this will be achieved by a number of items, including increased implicit bias training, ensuring greater diversity within our boards and commissions, revising department policies, as well as working with relevant community groups and city commissions, and also considering uh, joining city membership in the Government Alliance on Race and Equity, which is something that um, the County of San Bernardino just included in their resolution that passed 
very recently. Finally, the resolution ends in Exhibit A um, by saying to declare racism as a public health crisis in the city of Redlands is to direct our full attention to improving the quality of life and health of our residents who are marginalized based on their racial identity. This resolution recognizes that racism and oppression has dramatically affected the populations who have experienced more than 400 years of slavery, genocide, poverty, and forced relocation. Racism and its effects continue to contribute to generational trauma and millions of people in the state of California. I personally just want to thank everyone who took the time to write in public comments in support of this document and everyone who had a hand in crafting this resolution. I wanna take this moment to acknowledge that many of the public comments uh, tonight shared brave, honest and vulnerable personal stories of experiencing racism in Redlands. I want to let everyone know that I heard these stories loud and clear. And I think it's especially important in this moment to be listening to the lived experiences of people of color in our community and to recognize that racism has permeated our community as well as uh, the anti-blackness that exists here and across the nation. I also want to extend my, my thanks and gratitude to the city manager, city attorney, assistant city manager, and all of the city staff who helped in preparing this resolution to be agendized. I'm hopeful that my colleagues will see the value in this document and will not uh, allow it to be something that gets passed and never talked about again, but rather a living commitment to this important work of improving the lives and well-being of people of color in Redlands who are and historically have been amongst our most marginalized community members. I also will ask my colleagues to be respectful of the amount of work that has gone into this document, not just by council member Tejeda and myself, but by many engaged community members who spent countless hours with us being intentional about the language used in this resolution. If changes are proposed, I would appreciate if they add to the document rather than take away from it, as this is a significant issue in our collective attention to addressing racism within our community is long overdue. Thank you, and um, and now we'll pass it along to Council Member Tejeda. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that was very uh, detailed of the process. Um, and as Mayor Pro Tem Davis mentioned, this was basically uh, something that we facilitated for the effect, the, the community affected by racism. Um, whatever any of us feels about our community, uh, I think the one thing we can all uh, agree on is that it's a beautiful community. And I think that part of the beauty of this community is that we can sit down with each other and have these conversations. Um, and in discussing uh, racism, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Davis and I understood that it is important to talk to the people of Redlands who have been here for generations and ask them about their experiences. I will say I didn't grow up in Redlands. However, I have met many people who have lived here for generations um, and their families uh, describe uh, times and periods in this community where they felt marginalized. Um, and we can attribute that to, to racism. Um, while Redlands hasn't been on the, uh, uh, on the news uh, with issues where um, we're being highlighted for, for blatant um, discrimination and racism, racist acts, um, we should be thankful for that. Um, we, we need to recognize that um, it exists here in its, own, in its own form. And so in doing that, I contacted my good friend, Mario Salcedo, who chairs the Common Vision Coalition. And he wrote, uh, he wrote a, a letter of support that I'd like to share. He says, first, I'd like to thank Mayor Pro Tem Davis and Councilman Tejeda for their leadership and listening to our collective historical perspective and the impact of generations of racism in Redlands. While the current issues of racism and social injustice and inequities have risen to national consciousness, and yes, even here in Redlands, this resolution is a public statement of the historical racism and segregation and disparities of Native Americans, African Americans, immigrant cultures, and other people of color in Redlands. Mostly the labor force that built many of the assets for the economic growth and success of Redlands 139 year history. We now have a unique opportunity to acknowledge and showcase the contributions of its Native American and African American, Mexican American, Asian American, 
other communities of color in our downtown public and private spaces through public art and social gatherings. If we have such public common spaces to celebrate our rich, diverse, unique residence history, it would unite our communities. It would, it would be a giant step from the past to the present to teaching our younger generation that residence is serious about accepting the inclusion of its diversity. While we know this is just a start in addressing the issue of racism, it's a beginning nonetheless. And he writes that he supports the resolution and uh, also um, unity in the community and Redlands June Teeth, Juneteenth, excuse me. He looks, uh, his um, organization looks forward to serving as an advisory council in addressing racism as a public health crisis. And um, without, without his participation and without his surveying other uh, members of the community who have, again, long lived here for generations, people of color and of various um, ethnicities, what their experiences are in this community, this document wouldn't read what it reads today. So again, Mayor Pro Tem and Davis and I facilitated this conversation and the voice and tenor of the document is based on the, the conversations that we had. It is not, it, it, does, it does not reflect any, any um, I would say, I guess you could say it reflects some personal, uh, a bit of personal feelings with respect to racism, but at the same time, we wanted to put forth what members of this community have said um, they believe the resolution should say. And if we think back to the comments that have uh, been received and read into the record, uh, our colleagues should, should read that in some, in some instances, and even through the protests that have been going on, people are basically saying, let's, let's stop racism systemic racism, let's acknowledge that it's there and let's do something about it. Let's stop having um, token resolutions and token um, uh, gestures by, by local governments and, and state governments and the federal government. Let's really do something about this and start from the ground up. That's the, that's the intention of this document. It, it, it isn't obviously here to to offend anyone, it, it's mostly here to say we want to participate, and we believe that everything starts at the council level to participate in the healing process. And part of it is, you know, looking in the mirror and saying, "Yeah, this this uh, this behavior occurred in our community, and however minimal the behavior is today, it's still out there and in rearing its ugly head and." And by doing by by approve it, by approval and adoption of this resolution, we are making a commitment to to ending that type of tacit approval of of uh, those types of behaviors. And that's the conclusion of my comments. Thank you, Councilmember Tejeda. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Davis. Uh, Councilmember Momberger. Uh, okay. Uh, well, wow. Thank you so much to Mayor Pro Tem Davis and Councilman Tejeda for bringing this to us. I, you're, you don't even have to say, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, that a lot of work went into this. I, I can really see it and I really do appreciate it. it. It's past time for us to be talking about how we can foster an environment through policy that declares that racism is a public health issue and, and that racism is unacceptable. I, I have spent, if I can, throw in a couple of my own stories. It was very emotional for me to listen to all that public comment. And I think it was really valuable to hear uh, people's experiences. I remember um, more than once somebody saying to me as, as a child and even as an adult, they would say things to me like, wow, you're Mexican. I thought you were just normal. That was a common thing for people to say. And, and in my family, um, my grandparents, whose first language was Mex was sorry, Spanish, um, they did not allow their children to learn Spanish. Their own, their some you know language that something so important to their own culture because um, they didn't want their children to be at a disadvantage or to be treated um, differently because they were being identified 
as Mexican. So I just really, I really do offer a lot of appreciation and respect for this, um, for this movement here. Uh, Rylands needs to be a place where racism cannot thrive. And I'm, I'm just so honored in this moment to have the opportunity to be part of that declaration. So uh, resolutions declaring racism as a public health issue have been adopted by the county and by Los Angeles, Riverside, Moreno Valley, and Fontana. I would probably not surprise you to know that I, I printed them all out. And I went over all of the, the points in them and the, the way they articulated all of them. And I'm gonna get to why in a minute, but one of the things that really struck me is that they were all for the most part two pages long. Although Riverside, came in, it was shy and it was double spaced. So it, it's really much shorter than that. Uh, and then Moreno Valley was three full pages. And I just, frankly, I felt like it was rambling and uh, that it really dilutes the, the main focus. Um, but for the most part, they're, they're concise and they're clear. And while it's effectively explaining the connection between racism and public health, which I think is, is one of the most important things uh, to drive home here. Uh, the one before us tonight is is five full pages long, single spaced, and and that's I think um, both reflective of all the hard work that went into it and all of the many points people are hoping to make. But I also worry that that has an effect on its on its potency. I I'm going to say that I think we need to pare this down some, and I think it can be easily pared down. Um, I, I I think this this really can can just have a little bit stripped out without losing its its content. Um, I think we have also a stronger document when we are in accord with the resolutions of our neighbors. And, and I believe, that, well, the reason I'm saying that is, is I think that when the agencies in the region are resolving to basically do and adopt the same thing, then we have really joined forces. We, we're truly standing together and that we can make a bigger difference in that way. Um, so another thing I did was I kind of went through it and looked for the commonalities where, where we and our neighbors are, are articulating um, the same point. We're, we're standing together with them. Uh, so with those criteria in mind and a couple of others, but those are my biggest points and, and to be reflective of the changes I'm proposing here, um, I'm, I'm going to do the same in my comments. I proposed the, I, the modifying this resolution to a version that I emailed out, um, or I give it to staff, and I believe that it, it came to all of you by email. It does not change any of the wording, and it, it just, it, it, it strongly articulates the values and the goals that are represented in the original, but it does it within exactly two pages, although they are still single spaced. But, um, but I, don't, I don't change any of the wording. Um, and I, I want to I add something to this discussion here a little bit because I, I feel like it's important that the impetus for the momentum of, of 2020 um, against racism began with the killing of George Floyd. It began with some bad police officers. And I feel like it's, it's really important to know that the Redlands Police Department has done us very proud. That, and I wanna point out that when the eight can't wait reform suggestions came before us, that our chief within a minute sent us an email, he was able to show point by point how our local department had already implemented policies that were identical or similar to his suggestion. So um, I, just, I, I just feel like it's really important to point out that we are not um, suggesting an antagonistic relationship with, with our first responders. Um, basically, that well, that's it. We need, we need peace, we need unity, we need equality, we need it here and, and everywhere and, and for everyone. And I'm very, very happy to be talking about this in this moment and to be part of it. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Council Member Momberger. So you are also proposing the revision for us to consider this evening as well. I am. Um, Thank you, all of you. Uh, I'm sorry that Councilmember Barich isn't here to express his feelings about this and about uh, his appreciation for all the work that went into, and I should say thoughtfulness that went into all of this. Um, I've had a lot of time to think about it myself. I too looked at all of the resolutions from the other areas 
that have thus far uh, adopted uh, similar resolutions in our two county area, and I, I certainly hope there will be others. Um, I am a big believer in uh, succinct uh, documents, and I do feel that the original proposal um, is, is a bit verbose um, and, and quite long. And so I, I favor the proposal that Council Member Momberger has put forward um, as a document that has the appropriate reflection and vision on what we're trying to achieve here in uh, making it very clear that this community, and I hope all communities, will feel as though there is no place in our life for racism. Um, and But I think we can do that by doing a, a much shorter version of the same content and at the same time, perhaps bringing more people to embrace its vision than perhaps be uh, uncomfortable with it um, or feel as though uh, it singles out the city, the gr groups within the city uh, as not being uh, a, a, some groups and people that are not, are not supportive of racism. So um, we can proceed tonight, depending on how, uh, if there's any other comments or questions. It's always hard when we're not together in the same room to do this uh, on such an important topic. Um, I'm feeling very alone up here with none of my colleagues sitting on the dais with me where I can turn to them and look them in the eye and, and have this conversation. So to each of them, I apologize for the situation that we're in. Um, but depending on what you would all like to do, there are some options here. We can continue the dialogue tonight to see if, um, you know, it's, it's evident right now with only four of us in the room that if the vote was taken at this moment, it would be a 2-2 vote. Let's just call it for what it is. Um, so um, at this time, we can do a couple of things. We can talk some more and see if either of the respective members of the council, if there's another member that will come around to one way of viewing either of these resolutions um, in hopes of getting something passed that will reflect what we want it to, what, what, the light in which we want Redlands to be seen. Um, that's one approach. We can take a vote on each one in order and have a formalization of that, uh, at which time, if it came out the way that it looks like it might, um, then I would propose that we table the item uh, until our meeting in September. Normally, I would say only until our next meeting, but we are dark uh, by our prior action in the month, uh, month of August. Um, and we would need to put together a group of uh, two council members um, one from, uh, I, mean, I would suggest Council Member Momberger and any, either Council Member Tejeda or Council Member uh, Mayor Pro Tem Davis to work out some type of compromise version uh, of the resolution that can be brought back to us in uh, September. So that's kind of where we're at at this point. It's kind of my job to you know, be the, the one that guides the choices that we have up here, and that's where we're at. So with those comments, I open the floor back up to my colleagues. And, and if we were to continue the item, by the way, I would suggest to you, it would give uh, Councilmember Barich the opportunity to be present uh, outside of his family emergency and, and weigh into this discussion uh, as well. So I leave that for you as consideration also. Um, I, go ahead, Mayor Pro Tem Davis. I was about to ask you if you wanted to start. Sure, just just a few comments. Um, first of all, I think it's it's disappointing that we're in this position where we're not just passing the resolution uh, unanimously in this moment. Again, you know, Council Member Tejeda and I have both referred to the fact that the public was given an opportunity not only to to make comments within uh, our process in drafting this resolution, but every member of the public was given an equal opportunity to make public comments for tonight's meeting. And you, and you heard the comments, they were overwhelmingly in support of the document uh, that we presented. So, so I take that to mean that they're overwhelmingly in support of this document as it's written. And I would disagree, uh, Councilmember Momberger, in the sense that um, 
you know, the changes that you made do, do change the document dramatically. You, you've deleted about half of the document, which um, this, for me, this isn't an issue that we should dilute. This, this is an issue where I think it's important to be verbose. And, and honestly, it was a point of pride for Council Member Tejeda and me that our resolutions were more detailed than, um, than the county or than the cities in the region. To be honest, we started working on this before we even looked at any other document. And so we really wanted to make this something that uh, speaks to Redlands and to the experience of Redlanders. And um, with that, I feel really strongly about the document that we have put forward and uh, at this point don't support any changes. Council Member Tejeda. Um, I would echo some, some of the things you were saying uh, with respect to diluting um, the document. Um, I, I have this perspective. Um, this was, this document is verbose. However, it is, it is that way because there is a lot to say about this issue. Um, and in my research on how to write a well-written resolution, it clearly states that there needs to be uh, some sort of history connected to the, to the item that you're talking about. Um, and it progresses into the actions that you wanna take, you know, uh, in response to your preamble. Um, so knowing, knowing how a resolution should be written, that it needs to include a sort of chronological order of, of events, um, editing it to the extent that we are not including or talking about what uh, racism looked like in the city of Redlands. We're not saying, well, I'll just leave it that comment right there. What, it, what racism looked like for the people who experienced it. And this document was a lot shorter when we started. We felt the same way at the beginning. We felt it should be concise to the point. Um, we met with a lot of stakeholders, including the police department. Um, and matter of fact, they suggested we look at uh, the verbiage that was put forward from the, the county, the county's resolution. However, when we got to the stakeholders in Redlands, when they looked at the document that we had that we felt was very strong at the time and more concise, the perception was, why are you leaving us out? Why are you leaving Redlands out? Like, why are you, why are you not speaking to the experience of Redlands in this document? Why is this document more consistent with, or, and why does this document look like it's a response to what's happening right now? It should be a, a document that reflects what occurred in our city and how racism touched our city. And so when we heard those, those types of comments being made, and when we heard the people who actually had those experiences, here in Redlands, we thought it needs to include, you know, what they're saying because otherwise we are just we're doing just that. We're saying, you know, we're we are we're we want to we want to follow in the county's footsteps. We want to follow in other cities who who have already adopted such a a resolution. Um, I, I would dare to say that other cities and even the county didn't go as far as as meeting with stakeholders. Maybe they met with a few stakeholders, but they didn't meet the stakeholders that we met that were directly related to our community and asked us to produce a document that reflects our community. And uh, to speak to the point that Council Member Momberger made with respect to saying the, the, that our police officers are, are outstanding, you know, that, that goes without saying. Um, and when we met with them, uh, it was that it was their request not to be, not to be, in the spotlight, so to speak, um, to to let this document stand on its own as the experience of Redlanders. So I think that in in, in going through the stakeholders and in, in meeting with the police department, 
first and foremost, actually, that's where that's what we met with. Um, and uh, in reviewing the statements that were put out by uh, Chief Catron, if you, I, I hope you, when you detailed the the wording of the res resolution, notice that some of his words are included in in this document specifically. So that's how I believe that we're paying homage to to our uh, fine police department and the members of, of it. So I mean that's that's the, the, that's where I want to leave my, my comments right now. I think that I would hope that it's that we're not going to make it a question of whether it meets the word count threshold. And I know that's not what we're trying to say. We're trying to say concise, get to the point, and it's powerful. I don't disagree with those things. If it were a a resolution on something different, <laughs> that would that would merit conciseness. Um, but I think this resolution merits um, talking about and speaking to the history of racism in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Tejeda. Councilmember Monberger. Uh, sure. Um, yeah, I, I I know you know that I don't want to be an obstacle. I think this this resolution is um, important, and I think we're we're late to the game on it. Um, I will reiterate, uh, and I, I just want to, I guess, count, counter a couple of Mayor Pro Tem's points. I, it's funny that she used the word diluted. I, I felt like the biggest result of having it be so long was that it dilutes, it, it dilutes the important elements of it. Um, so I also um, wanted to counter another point. And I'm not sure how to how I want to say this. The the less you say, the more you include, right? When you're making legislation and you keep it short, it gives you a bigger umbrella of um, of coverage with your with your power there. And the more you talk, the more specific the target of your actions are. So the less powerful and the less uh, effective it is. So I, 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 I really, I really strongly feel like it's too long, but I, I'm sad that we feel like it's an all or nothing. There, there's a lot of value here. As I said, I went through using a, a specific filter that, that you may disagree with. I, I would kind of hope that maybe you might come back. I would love to find a compromise. I would love to have one of you say, well, hey, okay, uh, you took out something that that was really, I thought, important. Can we stick back this, this, and this, or or whatever? And that maybe we could negotiate into something that is still a little bit shorter than this, but that still accomplishes. Um, I don't know. I just it's it's really just really long, and and I just feel like that's problematic for me. So, um, Councilmember Momberger, if I yeah. may. I'm yes. looking at I'm, I'm looking at the document right now, and if we look at the preambular statement, along with the uh, now, therefore, be it resolved, it's actually one. You could say two pages. The rest of it is basically the action items that we that we want to that we want that not we excuse me that is not the right word to use. The action items are direct, derived from the the stakeholders. You know, one of the big one of the big questions to me was, is this going to be a token resolution where you just say uh, we're gonna we're gonna train some people and you know call it a day or whatnot, or is this going to be something that has some meat, you know, some teeth to it? And the more we spoke to these, again, the, the more we spoke to the stakeholders, and especially the Redlands stakeholders, this is what they're looking for. This is exactly what they're looking for in the document. Yeah, I, I'll agree with Council Member Tejeda, and we'll just say that we have gone through countless revisions already. I mean, this already feels uh, concise and really targeted to what we wanted it to say and what the stakeholders, like I said in my opening comments, um, we wanted to reflect what the stakeholders presented to us as important to be in this document. I printed out this document again last night and I'm really proud 
of the work that's gone into this and I'm proud of how it reads and I don't see it as too verbose and um, I guess I would I would be curious as to you know what pieces specifically you think uh, would be important to take out because at this point I don't see anything um, that that I think is important to take out yeah I wasn't I wasn't really looking at what what should I take out which is why I was kind of hoping you guys might counter like well as long as I could get this back in I would feel good about it I was more looking at which of these pieces summarizes the core uh, message of it and the and the the potent which ones are are inclusive and potent and and which ones if we were left with those would really cover it um, I'm, I'm going to jump in as then this will be my final comment um, Fontana's is fantastic I want to give I want to give a little credit to the really good work and it's about it's one page plus a paragraph and um, I just really think they nailed it but um, that's it that's that's all the comment I'm going to make thank you all um, what I'm hearing is that at this uh, juncture, neither Council Member uh, Tejeda or Mayor Pro Tim Davis are willing to make any changes to the document that they have prepared and submitted to the City Council. Um, I've heard Council Member Momberger try to offer some alternatives uh, at this point, but um, again, I sense that, that nobody's willing to move uh, completely to uh, find a compromise. Um, I do have one uh, question of the authors, which I have been asked by members of the community to ask uh, on the action items that you indicated in the document. Um, those that would require city expenditures uh, at a time that we are cutting the budgets and laying people off, where would you be looking for those dollars? Where would you be taking them from? What specifically are those items? The ones that for training, uh, emphasis on emphasis on changing hiring practices that might require additional financing to support them. I, the the comment is not the question is not coming from me. Uh, mm -hmm. It is a comment coming from, uh, I suppose you'd say some of the constituent groups that we have out there. I, I would respond to them that it, it would be subject to the these things would be subject to the budget. I mean, we didn't want to be. So insensitive that we didn't, un, you know, we're not understanding that, you know, in times of constraint, some things are going to have to be um, delayed, so to speak. And so when when there are no funds to do certain things, then we would have to, but we would have to, it would be nice to know that those things will not be uh, receiving any funding or those, those tasks will not be approved um if if uh well that's what be, that would be my response to 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 those uh individuals so let me try to say it a, perhaps a different way and ask whether the two of you agree you would not see these items as having a priority over all other operational uh, items that the city would have uh, needs for so okay i talked to the city manager about this today um, a little bit and and was made aware of the fact that we already have some uh, funding going to training and there's there's online training modules that the city is currently paying for i don't think this is the most effective uh, form of diversity equity and, and implicit bias training i would propose to reallocate some of that funding which is already in this uh, in this general arena to um, and i've been doing some outside exploring of trainers i think that in person training as much as we can do in-person training during a pandemic uh, is better than those online modules that people you know just click through and um, you know see as a requirement so i, I want to be intentional about the training that we offer and um, think that there already is money there that we can reallocate and beyond that uh, i've talked with the city manager about whether or not we can explore and i'm willing to do this work to explore uh, grant funding that could cover this i mean i i obviously Think that this is critically important and i think that the city needs to put its money where its mouth is in the sense that uh, our core values on the city's website you know state that diversity and inclusion is is of the utmost importance so we really need to be uh, prioritizing that where we can thank you for the question 
uh, and Mr. Duggan, it's okay, if, the... I may, and, and if I may interrupt, I'm sorry. Uh, I would suggest, Mayor Pro Tem, if this, uh, if it's looking the way it's looking right now, it may be better to table the item and have you and Council Member Momberger um, work work on a see what the see what the uh, see where it can be more concise. Can it be concise? There are some elements that that our stakeholders want, and I would say that those elements are those that speak to residents um, specifically and um, the action items as well. So, I mean, I would just, I would trust you to meet with council member Momberger and uh, try to work out a, a more concise version. Okay, I, as it looks like this is not going to pass tonight otherwise, which again is disappointing. Um, I am willing to do that. I'm willing to work with council member Momberger to revise this and uh, hopefully not lose any of the, the meaning that we have put into this with you know consultation from stakeholders in the community. Um, thank you. Let me uh, continue, continue just for a moment with my question of the city manager. Uh, Mr. Duggan, the issues around training, the, f the limited funding that we have currently, that funding is set aside for very specific required training, is it not? I believe so. Uh, we do have a number of trainings that employees go through. In fact, uh, council members are assigned them to. Uh, I would say, uh, I, I don't know offhand how much we have dedicated to that. Uh, it, it's considerably more expensive to have in-person training. Yes. Uh, also, it's, uh, it's a much more of a process in scheduling everyone to be in the same room. And I, and I do agree that in-person training is typically better than online training if you've got a great trainer and the material is well organized and things like that. Uh, however, it would be significantly more expensive to the city to have in-person training than to continue with the um, modules that we currently purchase from, uh, I think it's NeoGov. And currently our budget that was adopted is one that we have to live with as it is at present. We certainly, do, we, we can always modify the budget, but we really need to look forward to modifying the budget for the next fiscal year based on whatever happens in November. I, I believe so, yes. We, we, are, we, we have built the budget with a shortfall that we're covering with reserves this year. Uh, we've projected another significant shortfall, a greater one for the following year. And so uh, without additional revenues, even with additional revenues, we probably will be looking at still continuing to cut from the budget that we just finished at the end of uh, June. Uh, so we might be able to restore some of the cuts that were made this year. However, compared to what we would say a normal year, we're still looking at cutting even if the measure is successful in November. Thank you, Mr. Duggan. My colleagues are all very aware that uh, my particular preference when dealing with issues is to be very pragmatic um, and, and just, you know, frankly, get down to the bottom line. And for me, the bottom line is always gonna be about the finances. Uh, no matter how good things are on, on paper or how strongly you feel about them from the heart, we still have to be able to, uh, to pay for them. And I'm, I have no doubt that at some point we will be able to implement some of the things in this uh, resolution, and we should. Um, I am sensing, uh, and I, pr I very much appreciate uh, the flexibility that Council Member Tejeda particularly has shown in trying to move this thing forward to compromise and the Mayor Pro Tem's willingness to step forward to assist and support that effort. Um, however, I don't think that um, there's anyone here, and I believe that in the words that Council Member Momberger has shared, she feels very passionately about the importance of this issue, um, as do I. Uh, and she frankly reflects much of the same feeling that I have about it from a uh, emotional standpoint. Um, and I don't think either she or I, and I'm speaking for her, I don't think either she or I wish to stand in the way of something that we feel is valuable and important, even if we may disagree with its length or frankly, some of its content. Um, my only other concern is that I have a fifth council member who is not being able to weigh into this discussion. And, and I, there's part of me that would feel this to be the case when any one of you 
were not present on a very, very important issue. And my job as mayor would be to see that somehow you had an opportunity to voice your opinion just as much as the next council member. Uh, but with it, uh, and these unusual circumstances of us being dark in August, unless I am misreading uh, Council Member Momberger's feelings uh, about this issue. Not. Okay, thank you, Council <laughs> Member Momberger. Um, then I believe both the council member and I would be willing to support the resolution, uh, even with the concerns uh, that we have, because its importance over uh, arches uh, the concerns that we have at this time. Um, so I would like to thank uh, Mayor Pro Tem Davis and Council Member Tejeda uh, for this discussion um, and their willingness to engage in it with us. Um, I'd like to thank Councilmember Momberger for her very thoughtful uh, and attentive look at the document. It is, is certainly what I hope we do with all of our items on, our, on the agenda, but particularly those that have great importance to the community. So, uh, Councilmember Momberger, I appreciate everything you did in spending time with the document and giving feedback to our colleagues. Uh, at uh, this Mayor. time, uh, Councilmember uh, Tejeda Mayor. or Mayor Pro Tim Davis, if you'd like Mayor to make Foster. a motion. Uh, Mayor Foster. Yes. If I may, I, I, I realize that, I personally realize that you or, and Council Member Momberger and Council Member Barrett did not have the opportunity to work with us for Brown Act reasons. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that uh, Council Member Barrett is not here, but I would like to extend the opportunity for you and Council Member Momberger to have the opportunity to um, make the motion and the second. Oh, well, I appreciate that, council member. That's a tremendous honor and courtesy, but I didn't put the work in, and I've always believed that my council colleagues that have done that um, should be the ones to have the honor of making motions on the things they work so hard on. So thank you again, but I would defer to you and Mayor Pro Tem Davis to make the motions this evening. My okay, name goes well. on the resolution anyway. <laughs> <laughs> very well, I will defer to Mayor Pro Tem Davis to make the motion. Okay then, thank you. I move to approve resolution number 8113. I second. It's been moved by Mayor Pro Tem Davis, seconded by Council Member uh, Tejeda. Madam City Clerk, would you please call the roll? Council Member Tejeda. Yes. Council Member Momberger. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Davis. Yes. Mayor Foster. <coughs> yes. The motion passes unanimously, and again, I thank my colleagues for their diligent uh, work and for all those members of the community that uh, put their uh, emotions, their thoughts, their historical perspectives uh, into preparing uh, this resolution. Uh, it's my hope that other communities will pass something similar. Thank you all very much. All right, moving on now to public hearings. Uh, I'm gonna jump ahead. This is a public hearing on resolution number 8122, delinquent municipal services accounts reports. I'll declare the public hearing open and I will call upon management services and finance director Garcia, Ms. Garcia. This is assistant uh, finance director Farrah Jenner. I'll be presenting these items. Thank you, Ms. Jenner. I'm sorry they didn't give me your name as being the one that would present. I apologize. No problem. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Resolution 8122 is for the approval of the delinquent municipal service accounts and the subsequent reporting to the county auditor controller for the special assessment on the 2020-21 tax roll. These accounts are solid waste accounts with no water for con connection to the city. At the time of the staff report, there were 26 delinquent accounts. Since then, 14 accounts have been brought current. 12 accounts remain delinquent and will be reported by the August 10th deadline should you approve the resolution. The city will continue to accept payments on these accounts until August 24th. At that time, any accounts that are still delinquent and have not been paid will be reported to the county by the August 30th final deadline. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Ms. Jenner. Questions from members of the City Council of Staff at this time? All right, hearing none, I'll close the public hearing um, and I would entertain a motion. 
move to approve resolution number 8122. Second. It's been moved by Council Member Tata, seconded by Council Member Momberger. Madam City Clerk, would you please call the roll? Council Sorry, that was, that was Mayor Pro Tem Davis oh, who seconded it. Thank you, it sounded like you, my apologies, Mayor Pro Tem. No problem. Council Member Tejeda. Yes. Council Member Momberger. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Davis. Yes. Mayor Foster. Yes, the motion passes unanimously. Moving on now to resolution number 8123. Uh, this is a delinquent administrative citation fine report. Ms. Jenner, will you be making the report as well? Good evening, uh, resolution 8123 is for the approval of the delinquent administrative citation fine report and the subsequent reporting to the county uh, auditor controller for the special assessment for the 2020-21 tax roll. When the staff report was prepared, 135 citations were delinquent. Since then, 15 have been paid or removed from the listing. The remaining 120 accounts remain delinquent and will be reported by August 10th should this resolution be approved. The city will continue to accept payments on these accounts until August 24th. At that time, any accounts that are still delinquent will be reported to the county by the August 30th deadline. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Jenner. Questions of staff at this time from members of the city council. Hearing none, Madam City Clerk, were there any comments, questions, or testimony received from members of the public? Yes, there were. Those were read into the record. I believe there were five who requested, yes, there were five who requested their uh, properties be removed from the list. Thank you, Madam City Clerk. At this time, I'll close the public hearing and I'll move the matter to the City Council for a motion. Uh, I'd like to move to approve resolution 8123. Eight, Second. It's been moved by Councilmember Tejeda, seconded by Mayor Pro Tim Davis. Madam City Clerk, would you please call the roll? Councilmember Tejeda? Yes. Councilmember Momberger? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Davis? Yes. Mayor Foster? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Moving on to the next public hearing, this is the Triennial Public Health Goals Report. The public hearing is open, and I would turn it over to Municipal Utilities and Engineering Director Chow. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and uh, city council members. I'm seeking for your approval of the state required triannual public health goals report reflective of calendar years 2017, 2018, and 2019. The public health goals report is due every three years and the next one will occur in 2023. Your approval will allow the city to meet state mandated requirements in regard to public notification. It supports transparency and offers an opportunity for the city's customers to learn more about the water they consume. I have Kevin Watson, Cecilia Grego, and Paul Mariscal on the call with me uh, to answer any question you might have. Thank you, that concludes my report. Thank you, Director Chow. Are there questions of the director from members of the city council? Hearing none, again, Madam City Clerk, uh, were there any written comments received from the public? There were no written comments received. Thank you. I'll close the public hearing at this time and return to the council for a motion. Move the city council approve the triennial public health goals report. Second. It's been moved by Council Member Tata, seconded by Mayor Pro Tim Davis. Madam City Clerk, would you please call the roll? Council Member Tejeda. Yes. Council Member Momberger? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Davis? Yes. Mayor Foster? Yes, the motion passes unanimously. Moving on now to new business. The first item is the consideration of resolution number 8117, setting priorities for filing a written argument regarding a city measure. Madam City Clerk. Thank you, Mayor. On July 7, 2020, the City Council unanimously approved to submit an ordinance initiative to the County Elections Office proposing a one cent general transaction and use tax to the qualified voters in November 3, 2020. In accordance with California Elections Code, the legislative body or a member or members of the legislative body may file a written argument 
for or against the city measure with council authorization. Additionally, the city council may choose to authorize an individual voter who is eligible to vote on the measure or a bona fide association of citizens or a combination of voters and associations to file a written argument. Resolution number 8117 before you tonight is requesting your determination as to which, if any, council members will file a written argument. The last day to receive primary arguments is 5 p.m. August 17th in the clerk's office. Arguments should not exceed 300 words, and I'm available for questions. Thank you, Madam City Clerk. If I might just expand upon the recommendation, uh, my council colleagues are aware that there is a citizens committee that's been formed uh, to work on this item. Uh, they are in the process of drafting the argument uh, in favor. Um, and I would like to recommend that we authorize, uh, as I've been asked to do, to s that I will represent the council by my signature on the measure um, and that there will be a group of other citizens joining me in, in signing the document. Uh, so when we approve resolution eight, if we were to approve resolution 8117, it would be, be with that in consideration. Are there any questions from members of the city council? Hearing none, I would uh, move to approve resolution number 8117 with the modification as described. Second. It's been moved by myself and seconded by council member Tejeda. Uh, Madam city clerk, would you please call the roll? Council member Tejeda? Yes. Council member Momberger? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Davis? Yes. And Mayor Foster? Yes, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much, colleagues. The next item of business is the consideration of resolution number 8124 to, provi to provide for the continued suspicion of certain provisions of the Redlands Municipal Code as it relates to customer payments for utility services. Once again, I have Management Services and Finance Director Garcia as the presenter. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I apologize, I was muted on the other item. Um, the item before you is consideration of resolution number 8124. As you will recall, on March 17, 2020, the City Council adopted resolution 8066 to, to suspend uh, late fees and services connections as it relates to utility services and billing. This was done in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and its impacts on local businesses and residential customers. The suspension of these provisions is set to expire on July 28, 2020. At this time, given the unique nature of the circumstances facing many of the city's utility customers, and based on the need for further research to develop adequate repayment policies to assist delinquent accounts, staff recommends the adoption of resolution number 8124 to continue the suspension of late fees and service disconnections until a policy can be brought forth for consideration by City Council in September of this year. And that concludes my presentation. I'm available for more information. Thank you, Director Garcia. Questions of the Director at this time from members of the City Council? Hearing none, I would entertain a motion. I move to approve resolution number 8124. Second. It's been moved by Council Member Tejeda, seconded by Mayor Pro Tem Davis. Madam City Clerk, would you please call the roll? Council Member Tejeda. Yes. Council Member Momberger? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Davis? Yes. Mayor Foster? Yes, the motion passes unanimously. The next item of business is the consideration of ordinance number 2914 to amend chapter 1432 of the Redlands Municipal Code pertaining to flood damage prevention. Development Services Director DeSatner. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, in April of this year, the California Department of Water Resources conducted an audit of the city to ensure our compliance with FEMA guidelines for the National Flood Insurance Program. The audit identified a number of minor revisions needed to the muni city's municipal code uh, so that the city would be in compliance. The ordinance before you tonight will make the required changes, uh, all of which are minor in nature. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, uh, Director DeSatnick. Questions of the Director at this time from members of the Council? Hearing none, Madam City Clerk, would you please read the title of Ordinance 2914? An Ordinance of the City of Redlands amending Chapter 15.32 of the Redlands Municipal Code relating to flood damage prevention and flood plain management. 
Oh, give me one second. Uh, I move to approve resolution number 8124. Did I ever do that? If I might, council member, I move to waive further reading of ordinance number 2914 and to introduce ordinance number 2914. I apologize, I second that. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, Madam City Clerk, would you please call the roll? Council member Tejeda. Yes. Council member Momberger. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Davis. Yes. And Mayor Foster. Yes, the motion passes unanimously. The next item is the consideration to accept a local early action planning LEAP grant in the amount of $300,000 and authorize an additional appropriation of the same in consideration of a professional services agreement with Michael Baker International to prepare the city's housing element update in an amount not to exceed $241,045 and determination that professional services agreement is exempt from environmental review pursuant to section 15061B3 of the state's guidelines implementing the California Environmental Quality Act. Development Services Director DeSat. Thank you again, Mayor. At, at the May 19th council meeting, the city council authorized staff to submit a grant application to the state under the local early action planning grant program for the preparation of the update to the city's housing element of the general plan. This grant application has now been approved by the state and staff uh, solicited proposals uh, for consultants to help us prepare the housing element. <coughs> We've selected uh, Michael Baker International and have negotiated a contract um, and that is before the council tonight. The housing element is due uh, <coughs> to the state uh, November of 2021 and that concludes my presentation. I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Director DeSatnik. Uh, questions of the director from members of the city council? Um, I, I do have some, well, questions, but uh, more so for the general public, uh, due to the fact that it's uh, about housing. And I'd like to uh, ask the director to reiterate the, the fact that this is a state mandate and that the state is asking us, well, this is something that has to happen because we need to be in compliance. You already mentioned that, but I wanna reiterate that fact because there are many people who believe that we can just arbitrarily say, we don't want to do what we're supposed to do because the state legislature does, I don't agree with the state legislature. And, and to me, it's really important every time we have these discussions about updating any type of housing that we reiterate that we have to be in compliance. I think you just did that council member and <laughs> I assume the director would agree. Yes. All right. Any other questions or comments from members of the city council? Hearing none, I would entertain a motion. I move that the city council accept the local early action planning grant from the state of California Housing and Community Development Department in the amount of $300,000 and further move to authorize an additional appropriation in the amount of $300,000 in fiscal year 2020-2021 planning grants fund and Move that the city council find that the professional services agreement between the city of Redlands and Michael Baker International Incorporated is exempt from environment, <coughs> environmental review pursuant to section 15061B3 of the state's guidelines implementing the California Environmental Quality Act. And I further move that the city council approve the professional services agreement between the city of Redlands and Michael Baker International Incorporated for professional planning services to prepare the city's housing element update. Second. The motion was moved by council member Tejeda and I believe was seconded by Mayor Pro Tem Davis. Is that correct, Mayor Pro Tem? Yes, that's correct. Okay, Madam City Clerk, would you please call the roll? Council member Tejeda. Yes. Council member Momberger. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Davis. Yes. Mayor Foster. Yes, the motion passes unanimously. The next item of business is the consideration of a proposed development agreement for tentative track map number 16878, located at the southwest corner of North Wabash Avenue and East San Bernardino Avenue. Development Services Director DeSatnick. Thank you. 
uh, Lone Chang LLC uh, has filed an application with the city for a development agreement for tentative tract map number 16878. This map consists of 76 single family lots on a 41 acre site and it was originally approved on April 5th, 2005, which makes the map as of today just over 15 years old. The project site, again, as the mayor indicated, is located at the southwest corner of East San Bernardino Avenue and North Wabash Avenue. The map was originally approved uh, per the municipal code, was valid for two years. Uh, subsequently, the map received six one-year extensions from the city, which is the maximum number of extensions permitted under the city's municipal code. It also received seven years worth of blanket extensions from the state, which were issued to all projects with existing entitlements uh, in response to the last recession. All of these extensions have allowed the map to remain valid in uh, through April 5th, 2020. The, de the development agreement that is proposed by the applicant includes the following um, terms. Uh, protection against having any future changes in state or city laws applied to the project. Extension of the life of the subdivision map for an additional five years and a donation of $10,000 to the city's cultural arts program fund. Typically, development agreements are entered into to provide the applicant for a development project and the city with certain assurances, such that if a developer starts a project and is making a significant investment in the project, that the laws applicable to the project will not subsequently change and adversely affect the developer's investment expectations. And on the city side, that the public improvements related to the project will be completed, often in a phased manner. Staff questions whether a development agreement is the appropriate legal mechanism to facilitate the time extension of a subdivision map and whether it's in the city's best interest to do so. Development agreements are customarily considered as part of the land use entitlement process at the initial time that a project is approved, not 15 years after the project's approval. Staff does not believe that approving a, an agreement for this purpose is a good land use practice and in doing so would set a precedent for future projects. The proposed agreement itself does not provide any certainty that the project will be developed. It only stipulates that the development rights will be maintained for an additional five years. Therefore, staff's recommendation is to deny the request for the development agreement. The application, uh, the, I'm sorry, the applicant's representative, Mr. Pat Meyer, prepared a letter to the Planning Commission explaining their position. This letter was attached, also attached to the staff report uh, for tonight's agenda item. Mr. Meyer is in the meeting and would like to make a presentation to the council on this item. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Director DeSatner. Questions of the director at this time? Hearing none, the council recognizes Pat Meyer, the applicant's representative. Mr. Meyer, you may address the council. Mr. Meyer, are you still online? Yeah, I'm here. Thank you, okay. Mayor. Members of the council, I was getting <laughs> unmuted. <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Um, I submitted a letter and hopefully you all were able to review that. This particular property has been subject to some very unusual circumstances, including the Great Recession, where nothing happened for almost 12 years. And then subsequently, when I got involved just three years ago, we discovered that the civil engineer that prepared all the work was no longer around and all of his digital files, studies and reports were no longer available to us. And so at the bequest of the city staff, we actually spent about $100,000 updating all of the maps and plans, including water quality and hydrology and submitted those and were approved in late 2018. The map has had an, uh, 
extraordinary amount of interest. However, about this time last year, most of the, the builders discovered that it would be pretty risky to start preparing the final plans and the final track map when it could potentially expire in April and they would be out several hundred thousand dollars with, with, with no final map. So that's when we came up with the idea of providing some additional time on the map through the approval of a development agreement. The, 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 initial, the initial development agreement proposed a five-year extension. However, I think we only need about 18 months to get this done. Um, as, as Mr. Desatnik knows, if we, if we get approval of the development agreement, it would only extend the map from April of this year. So, so basically six months is gonna be wasted just going through this process. And so we're gonna need about another year to go through all the final engineering and plan check and posting of the bonds and the recordation of the map. This family is willing to commit to that. So I think that I would recommend the alternative motion, which is to direct staff to commence negotiations with the applicant. We will reduce the time frame of the map extension from five years down to 18 months or two years. Um, and we will move forward with the development. As you recall, uh, land advisors, Doug Jurisma submitted a letter. There's a lot of interest in the property and I'm confident that we can get it done in this time frame. Thank you, Mayor. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. Questions of the applicant's representative at this time from members of the city council. I would, I would have a question, yes. Uh, Mr. Meyer, uh, is there, um, in, if I were to support um, your position, is there, what I would like to see included in the, in the language is a finality, right? So if I say I agree with you that, that I believe you and I trust you that you're going to get this done with the extension that we, that I'm considering, that you're proposing, that that is the the final. There's no more. While well, the economy is down, uh, any type of uh, uh, rationale for for requesting more and more time because I think 15 years is a long time, and and we've gone through one uh, downturn in the economy, and you know, without I feel it merits a little bit of berating of the of the actual person who's applying. It's not you. I'm glad that they're working with you because I know that when when you brought projects to us that you marshal them through uh, the the planning process, if, you know, with a, uh, you have a good reputation doing that and, and getting that accomplished. It's the only reason why I would consider um, what you're proposing, but I would like to see in any language that gets worked out, uh, you know, something that says this is the final straw. Thank you, council member. Other comments or questions from members of the city council of Mr. Meyer? Okay, um, for my part, I share uh, council member Tejeda's view. I'm willing to support a two year extension under the alternate motion, but I would insist that it actually have, actually have language in the agreement. There will be no further extensions at the end of that period. I believe that's what you're saying, council member Tejeda, correct? Right. So I'm willing to support that as well. I don't know how the other two members of the city council feel. I'm willing to support that amendment. Okay. Councilman well, Momberger, any thoughts? Yeah, I absolutely would not. Okay. Um, absolutely no. This is a real easy one for me. Our, our municipal code addresses this saying that, that projects can have two years where we're gonna freeze the the current code criteria, the current laws, and then after two years, gosh, we'll be flexible in one year increments as circumstances warrant. If you can convince first the, you know, if you can convince the planning commission and if necessary, the city council will give you the extra extension, we'll give you the year. But, but two years is the spirit of our law. So even with the flexibility built in, that gets us like six years, for a project to sit behind the standards and vision of that time. 
It is also explicitly written into our city code that you cannot exceed 10 years. This is in the Redland City Code. And this project is already at 15 years. It's, it's a 15 year old design. And I understand that some of the upgrades that have been requested have been made. I'm, I was very pleased when this was coming before us in April um, that, that it was gonna involve the, the, the water basin. And, and I know they've added some park space, but, but these are modifications to a 15 year old design. This is, uh, this is a stale design and forget the fact that it's a stale design. And I, it's, it's the fact that it's been 15 years when our municipal code says, we're gonna allow you to get about, because we recognize that you start making investments in the project, we're gonna allow you to get two years behind the city's design vision. But, we're, but it, 15 years is, is simply too much. I, I fully understand that some of the delays to this project have been unfair, but nonetheless, this is a design from another era. And, and, and I think it's really important to point out that denying further extensions of this project does not reject the project. This, this can be the, the, the way our code is written, it's supposed to work like this. The builder, if he gets too far away in time from the code, from the, the standards that the city has adopted for engineering, um, can just resubmit and start it fresh and, and be in compliance with the current city codes and the general plan criteria. Um, the, last, the last element of this that is really the big, the, a huge one, is that I am totally uncomfortable approving uh, against the staff recommendation, and this sounds like a firm recommendation against approval, and in the absence of a planning commission recommendation. Like who, who is advocating for this? I just, these are huge red flags for me and I'm, I, I apologize, Mr. Meyer, with, with respect. I, I gotta say no to this. Mr. Director DeSantnick, the Planning Commission could not come to a recommendation? As you know, there's only six members on the commission at present and they voted 3-3 three, three on, a, on a motion <laughs> to support the uh, Gee, I seem to know how that feels lately. <laughs> um, Mr. McHugh, is there any legal violation for proceeding with the alternate motion as it's been rec as it's been proposed tonight? Mayor Foster, I presented to the City Council a comprehensive memorandum that provided my legal analysis of this request. Uh, the only comment I can make is that, as uh, Council Member. Momberger had pointed out both the municipal code and the subdivision map act provision which govern this section have this limitation of 10 years on discretionary uh, extensions. So that was one of the points that we made clear in the memorandum. My point being is the alternative motion would be contrary to that 10 years. Would be contrary to the municipal code. Yes, and, the, and that phrase in the subdivision map act. Council members, how would you like to proceed? I would say that that bit of information is important to consider and, th and that changes things for me. I wanna, I wanna say something about Mr. Rogers at, at this point. <laughs> when I hear this, the Subdivision Map Act, what would Mr. Rogers be saying right now? Can anybody? Uh... <laughs> he actually gave public comment on exactly this when it came before the board in June of 2017. I watched that footage this afternoon. Oh, wow. I think that in, having been a planning commissioner, um, I can tell you that it is unusual when the planning commission divides in the way that it has, but I can tell you that uh, without having been party to that discussion, that they probably had a hard time because just like we're talking about, they can see some reasonability in the request. And for others, they're more purists and they wanna just go with what's in the municipal code. Um, I'm personally still not troubled with uh, the extension. Uh, maybe it's, you know, I'll, I'll just say I'm not troubled by it um, with, a flat, with a flat ending uh, date to it to encourage the, de the developer to proceed with his project. Mayor but Foster, I can only speak can, for myself. If I can add to that, I think, and I hate, I hate to, to look at this as if, you know, if, if we look at the, the times that we have right now with respect to the budget, 
if this were a project that were to come forward in the next couple of years, I think the revenue that would come from it, from the uh, the permits and the other fees would be, I think it would be important for us to receive. I get, I, I agree with everything Council Member Momberger says and it makes me want to flip my vote. Uh, but I- In I, that case, I'd like to make a motion. <laughs> but I'm gonna say that uh, like 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 Mayor Foster, I, I am not because of the circumstances with the budget the way they are, and we don't know if what's going to happen with respect to the um, you know with November with respect to the way that we want uh, funding uh, to be increased by the public. I mean, to me, this is an opportunity to to say this is the final straw. I get that. Um, and I, and I, when, when Mr. Rogers comes down to say, why did you do that? I would give him the same answer. I'm, I'm worried about the budget. And I think this, this, if this, um, if Mr. Meyer sticks to the, to his word and gets this done in the next 18 months, I'm gonna keep him the 18 months. <laughs> um, you know, I think this will be good for us. Okay. Mayor. Mayor, can I make a final comment? No, Mr. Meyer, I'm sorry. I've already allowed you the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion anyway. Okay. If I may, for the reasons stated in the staff report and considering the verbal and written testimony provided to this council, I move to deny the application requesting the city negotiate and process a development agreement for tentative track map number 16878. I will second that. It's been moved by Council Member Momberger and seconded by Mayor Pro Tem Davis. Madam City Clerk, would you please call the roll? Council Member Tejeda. No. Council Member Momberger. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Davis. Yes. Mayor Foster. No. So it's just that kind of night, guys. Um, may I suggest, unless the staff has any other recommendations, we have a, a vote that has gone 2-2. I would like to suggest that this item be continued to the first meeting of September, at which time I would expect Mayor, uh, Council Member Barish to be present and the council can once again entertain the discussion. Any objection? Hearing none, then it's so directed. All right, moving right along to the next item of business uh, is a consideration of CEQA exemption and resolution number 8118, adopting local vehicle miles traveled threshold of significance and the City of Redland CEQA assessment VMT analysis guidelines. Development Services Director Quesada. Thank you again. Since the early 2000s, the state of California has passed a number of bills aimed at addressing efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions statewide. One of these bills, SB 743, which was signed into law in 2013, updated the California Environmental Quality Act guidelines, making the vehicle miles traveled, or VMT for short, the new official metric to analyze transportation impacts from development projects. SB 743 mandates that all jurisdictions be, begin using the VMT metric in all CEQA related transportation analyses after July 1st, 2020. The idea behind that development is, is that the development that results in fewer fewer vehicle miles traveled will also result in less greenhouse gas emissions. The focus on VMT will favor infill projects and other types of projects that through, through their form or other mitigation measures create relatively fewer car trips and encourage walking, biking, and use of public transportation. This is really not a new idea for the city of Redlands as our general plan promotes the exact same concept. City, over the last 18 months, the city has participated in a regional study led by the San Bernardino County Transportation Authority, along with 24 other jurisdictions in the county, with the goal of assisting the cities in developing their own thresholds of significance and analyses guidelines for implementing the transition to VMT. 
a consulting firm of Fair and Peers was engaged by um, the Transportation Authority to provide the technical analysis as well as the firm EPD Solutions to provide specific analysis to the City of Redlands. The proposed VMT threshold of significance and analysis guidelines that are before you tonight were reviewed by the Planning Commission on June 23rd and the Commission voted unanimously to recommend adoption by the City Council. The City also engaged outside Council to provide additional legal review of the proposed guidelines. And we are recommending that the uh, council adopt the resolution tonight that would set the threshold and adopt the uh, analysis guidelines so that we can begin implementing them on uh, projects beginning this month. And with that, I, I do have our consultant team members uh, available on the call if there's any particular questions of the council or I'll, I'll be happy to answer questions as well. Thank you, Director DeSatnick. Any questions uh, from members of the Council of the Director? I have one question, uh, Council Member Momberger. I believe this matter came before the SCAG board as our representative. Do you have any comments directed from the discussions at SCAG? I think that Director DeSatnick covered it pretty well. This is a, this is a big topic of discussion for us, and um, I think it's important, and I support it. Thank you very much. Other questions or comments from council members? Hearing none, I would entertain a motion. I move the city council adopt resolution number 8118. This is Monberger, I second. It's been moved by council member Tejeda, seconded by council member Monberger. Madam city clerk, would you please call the roll? Council member Tejeda? Yes. Council member Monberger? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Davis? Yes. And Mayor Foster? Yes, the motion stands approved by unanimously. Uh, with that, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for participating.